What's up? It's Sonny from 856 here. I'm with Joe Hardcore. What's up, man? How are you? From um, This is Hardcore. This is Hardcore Podcast. If you've been following This is Hardcore Podcast, I think you're like, what, 30 episodes in? This is our 30th. This is our 30th. Uh, obviously, this is video. <laughs> this is the first video for yeah. This is Hardcore Podcast. So Joe doesn't know much about video, so he no. called... He called someone that might know a little bit about video. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. I've helped, I've helped him out a little bit over the years with some video work. So he hit me up, said, hey, can you help me film an uh, intro for, for, for uh, this uh, episode that you're about to watch. So what made you want to go from like the audio only podcast to what we're about to do? So I wanted to talk to Paris Mayhew probably for a long time, especially because we had done so many cro shows, which is now cro JM. And uh, with the beginning of the podcast, which Sonny is episode two, bop, 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 one of the most popular episodes we ever had. And um, we get to the point where Paris had created this video called Chaos Magic and was like back with a band called The Agros. And he hit us up and was like, hey, I'd love to be on the show. You know, anything you can do to help promote this. So here you are, you know. Here's the opportunity to speak to the third Crowman, someone who has one of the most impactful influences in all of hardcore with what he wrote and he goes through in this video and explains the songs that he was thinking about when he wrote the cro songs in his mother's house. And that's why, in, in hindsight, making a video is so cool because you see him talking about the fret. And so he's like, yeah, do you ever do a video? I'm like, nah, not really. And he's like, oh, we should try. And if Paris wants a video, Paris gets a video. And, and with us being at six months in, 30 episodes in, I got Sonny right here and, uh, another chance for us to link up, hang out, and uh, get this done. So it's a symbiotic relationship between This Is Hardcore and Sonny and myself, added to the fact that Paris Mayhew is not only a cro who is directly responsible for a huge metallic influence in hardcore, but he's a fucking director of multiple music videos. I was just gonna say that, because I don't think people realize that he's like an actual camera operator, like legit, <laughs> so and if you've been watching the video so far, you, they've seen the music video. He talks about how he found film, how he began shooting bands like Biohazard and Onyx and all this amazing videos all come to Paris. So to, I mean, the, we're taking a roll here just because of how good he is with doing this intro, but uh, we had to take a shot and I, I just appreciate Sonny and obviously all the years we've been doing this hardcore, Hey 5 6 it's a good way to link up for our first video. I don't think there's gonna be many until way down the line, but how to do it for this one, and I'm really excited to see the res respect given to him when you see this video and you hear this music. This is possibly the first time I've heard anything out of a member of the cro that can go right back to the sound of the original cro and it's a fantastic song. And obviously with the COVID, the aggros can't play live yet, but he has intentions on playing live, and I can't wait to see what happens. I feel like hopefully you do more of these. I feel like a lot of podcasters are doing the audio version on Spotify, whatever, and then they also have the video version as well? I mean, you know I learned how to use my microphone correctly last week. <laughs> <laughs> That's partially my fault. I helped Joe pick out the microphone and I didn't tell him that this is the front side to talk into, this back side. Because I actually, someone called me out on Instagram, like, dude, you're using the microphone wrong. And I got so mad and I forgot to tell you that you got to talk into the right side of the microphone. I got the sock gimmick, the, wind, the windscreen. So I never saw the word back. Yeah. I kept getting clowned on and I was like, fuck, I need to do better. And I just went to YouTube and Step three was like, make sure you're talking to Audio Technica. And I'm like, oh, fuck you. I just did these episodes. So I'm still learning. And I, I, I want this to come out every week. Like I said, it's maybe it'll be a little wonky sometimes. So we're a baby step into a video and Sonny's going to teach me. And just like he's teaching me about Patreon, same thing. I got to learn. But I pour concrete all day. I got to learn from best. So I got him. Cool. You're the best. Oh, yeah. And you're a beautiful son of a bitch. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> we all can't have this now. No, thank you, Sonny. Yep. And uh, I, it's going to be a long one, but Paris is worth it. It's a fantastic story, hardcore history. This is everything you would ever want, in my opinion, to hear from Paris's mouth. 
and the video was absolutely fantastic and I hope you guys enjoy it. So thank you. Should we roll it? Yeah, let's roll. Let's roll it. We are talking to Paris Mayhew, who is someone in hardcore who doesn't get enough of a voice between former band members constantly going back and forth. If you listen to anything in the 1980s, you will see the emerging sounds of both metallic and punk. And I think Paris put it together perfectly in what would become Chromags. And obviously, Chromags would become the blueprint for so much of New York hardcore to come. He also has an entire career in film. We're going to get into a lot of that. And he's come back out with a band called The Agros. And the shit is absolutely fantastic. And I think with so many people having different opinions on Chromags, it was important to have Paris come on and hear his story and hear his impact on hardcore music. Thank you for sharing your audience with me. And uh, yeah, obviously for me, the focus will be Agros, you know, Chromax is certainly part of my legacy, but um, I, I, I basically just see the Agros as a continuation because, you know, I haven't been musically active for a while. And so when I picked it up again and put out this song, it really, to me, it was as if no time had passed, you know, since I put out Revenge. To me, this is just the next step after Revenge. I'm just continuing to write songs. I didn't do it in a different way. I didn't adjust anything. I just do what I enjoy. And that's so, why. Sonically, it sounds exactly like, as you just said, it sounds like, okay, like you were, you were just waiting for that moment to drop this. And it, 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 you could see it not only in the plan and it, it, the tones and it, it kind of harkens you right back to, Oh shit. All right. He's picking it right back where it left off. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting, you know, when to think about how much time went into making those records, like especially revenge. I mean, we must've been in the studio for nine months. But, you know, even Best Wishes, you know, you, a month, you know, to make the record. I, I recorded Chaos Magic in an afternoon. There's almost no punches. I did the whole thing live, mostly because the engineer didn't like to do punches and he was very impatient. So I just practiced and I literally played the song from beginning to end four times because there's four guitar tracks. And there's almost no punch. And I played it to a click. I didn't even play it to a drummer because I knew the drums in my head. And I just laid the whole thing out in one afternoon, played the bass, and then I guided the drummer through the through the performance, and we punched the drums in, and that was it. It was, you know, not so much all this preparation or, or discussion or, or collaboration. It was just I sat down, wrote the song, I recorded it exactly the way I wanted, and that's the way it sounded. And the fact that most people are saying, oh, my God, it just sounds like, you know, another Chromag song. Well, of course, that makes sense. I was the primary songwriter in the band. Well, I feel like the interesting thing that you just touched on is something that we spoke on other episodes, especially with younger folks. They have they have entire band practices with members in different states. And the mm. use of technology allows them to get the riff down and then they hone it down in the studio a lot like what you just said. So it's kind of it's kind of awesome to hear that like a you know a forebearer for the entire hardcore sound has picked up on the di- digital age and not gone back to like the analog like no, we better t- punch this in. And I that video specifically, which, I mean, it, it looks amazing. And you are the only person pictured it. There's, you, don't, you don't really see the drummer because there isn't one. It's kind of like a fantastic, like this is completely a Paris project, including like the logo looks great. And when it came out, I was kind of blown away. Like, you don't know what's going to come out of a person who's been playing hardcore music for 40 years. And frankly, a lot of the times, New York hardcore bands, they want to go steps beyond the sound that their fan base really appreciates. But the Chaos Magic track is really just, you know, like the third act for you playing this music. And it's, it's fantastic. It sounds great. And um, actually, I think I watched you do a playthrough. And yeah. just watching watching on YouTube, the, the way that you attack the strings is so much like that older style. And you don't see that done. And I think that gives a lot of cadence to why the, why it's so aggressive when it picks up in that, you know? Well, I'm glad you perceived it that way as being, you know, my my thing singularly. And I, I certainly intended that because, you know, I've been faced with for the past two decades, people going out and making a living and touring, playing my songs who ha- who didn't even participate in the writing of them. You know, I mean, like two two complete bands, like, for example, the Chromex JM. I mean, when they perform World Peace uh life of my own 
uh, Signs of the Times, Hard Times. When they all those songs are completely cover songs. Nobody standing on that stage had anything to do with writing the songs. So I, I definitely want. I, I'm definitely. I'm never going to be in a position again where the music I write and create from like scratch from myself is ever going to be on stage with somebody else claiming it as their own. That, Cause that just will never happen again. Multiple times in different uh, eras, you spoke about early cro stuff and eventually we're going to get to that. And I always, I always hear, so, I always hear stories about John Watson. In fact, the last time Todd used to come through, he had first come through a blood clot and then with his own uh, band. And he was also talking about John Watson and, and like, and how much of a figure he was. And I know that it's got to be difficult as a player and as a musician with published music to see people play the music. But I also wonder, is there a part of you that understands the cultural impact of cro And even though you're not on stage, it actually is still a testament to what you guys wrote almost 40 years ago. And that's why the fans uh, enjoy the music so much. It's like the bittersweet thing I imagine for you to say like, Oh yeah, I'm not on stage but your fans are still with you guys 40 years later. Oh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, there was a long period of time before this whole social media phenomenon happened where I really felt just totally disconnected. I felt like, you know, memory had faded and all the things that we had done had just basically been encapsulated in this record that was on my shelf, except for, you know, when you walk down the street and you inevitably run into somebody who yells from across, oh my God, bro, thanks. But not not often enough to make it to really feel connected, and and uh, and for a long long time I felt completely disconnected from the legacy. But then this this slow phenomenon happened mostly when Facebook came around, where you were suddenly I was suddenly uh, connected to the entire world, and you know people fans immediately you know they come and befriend you, and the next thing you know you have fifty five hundred five thousand friends from all around the world e- expressing their gratitude on a daily basis. It's really extraordinary. So suddenly um, I was reconnected and uh, I, and I did realize the impact it had, but for a long time, I wasn't aware of it. it, it you know how it is, you know, when long periods of time go by, you really have a hard time. At least I have a hard time connecting to it personally. I'm, I'm, I feel connected to the music, but the whole phenomenon of, of the impact it had on people, I was very disconnected from, but uh, I feel connected again. And I, that's why I, I, I started out by thanking you for sharing your audience with me. I understand you have a vast audience. It, it seems to be the go-to audience uh, for hardcore music. And uh, the fact that I'm going to be able to speak to those folks is, is fantastic. One of the things that I think people miss out on when they talk about the Cro-Mags legacy is the fact that, unless I'm mistaken here, you you were there, and I and I actually have a separate entire podcast that's like in the brewing stages where we're talking to the first generation of hardcore people, like not the people that were like, I bought this record and then I found a hardcore record. You were there when the first bands were playing the very first hardcore songs. Absolutely. And I remember this. And I remember this quote from the Tony Rettman book where you're like, you know, I come from Rush and real technical music. So it took me a second to understand the musicality of Bad Brains. And it hit me at that time that even though cro had started like kind of brewing in, in the early 80s, that unless I'm mistaken, every single one of you guys were there at the very beginning of this entire process. And um, it, Absolutely. It's funny that you that you mentioned that bad brains thing, because I, I really had a hard time putting them in, in a context, you know, cause all the bands that I like to listen to played Madison square garden, you know, you were either, you know, a bar band or you were these bands, these, you know, the gods, the, the Zeppelins and yes. And rush and Van Halen and Aerosmith who played these tremendous places. But then I, 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 I saw the stimulators and the bad brains at Max's Kansas city. And after seeing them, you know, all the time because they all they played all the time. I I realized that I liked them just as much as I liked Rush and Van Halen and Aerosmith. But I had but my but I had a uh, like a cognitive dissonance. Like I couldn't get my brain around 
the fact that I enjoyed them because I couldn't I, I couldn't put them in that Madison Square Garden context. So I couldn't justify how much I liked them. I mean, I know this sounds funny, but this is what 14 year olds think, <laughs> you know, 15 year olds think they sit around uh, wondering uh, these kinds of things. But uh, I, I, it really took me a long time to um, maybe even years later to realize how significant those bands were. Especially the Bad Bruins and Black Flag, and 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 I certainly was there. Uh, I I just started venturing. You know, I, I, I as a kid, I would just venture out on my skateboard and uh, in the middle of the night and just skateboard around. And I discovered this bar when I was fourteen that would serve me on Avenue A, and uh, I started drinking there. And I would see like this very small group of kids across the street. And I, when I had gone to Max's Kansas city to see the stimulators on the recommendation of a, a kid at school. And um, so I, I it, it was really kind of the end of the punk rock scene in New York city, which it, you know, was kind of puttering along, um, you know, the, the, the bands that everybody thinks of the Ramones and Blondie and talking heads and all that, that era was, you know, as in a teenager's mind was long gone, you know, a year is, is a lifetime and so i all these bands started popping up significant bands even in the beginning like kraut and stimulators and bad brains and um and i do remember when there was no term hardcore and i actually remember having a conversation with paul dordal who was uh a figure on the scene at the time who he actually wrote song he was me him and harley were actually the original chromags but um, he and some of the songs that me and him had written together before that uh, became Murphy's Law songs, uh, California Pipeline and Skinhead Rebel. And, uh, and and again, we were having one of those teenage conversations. And, and I was just saying, you know, I love the Sex Pistols and the Dead Boys, but I really don't identify with this whole punk rock thing. And he said, so uh, and that's when he brought up this word hardcore that I'd never heard before. And it was just starting to be bandied around. And I said, well, anything's better than being called a punk. So. That, that was, seems that seems to be in the stuff that I've been uh, working on is that, and and you alliterated perfectly, at the time in the mid nineteen seventies, New York City was like switching from like Andy Warhol, Sex Pistols, you know, the avant garde uh, kind of like presentation of punk rock, and the bands who would eventually go to play for Peter Crowley at Max's Kansas City. Actually, Ra uh, you know Ralphie uh, from the Mob, he's getting me an in interview with Peter Crowley. And um, Peter Crowley said it best. He's like, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get bands to play in this room. And then there was a quote from uh, Mercedes who was in the Steam Leaders as well. And she had said, we went out, we were playing, and they were like, oh, you missed that sound. That sound was over. So we said, fuck it, we're just going to play faster than them. And that was like part of the inception that would create what is now known as hardcore punk. I am. I mean, for me, the, the appeal was, it seemed in that era, all the rock bands were disappearing. You know, the last holdout was kind of Van Halen and uh, the radio was turning into Blondie and the cars and all that stuff. And uh, for me, when I heard the Sex Pistols, all of a sudden I was hearing this super aggressive, raw guitar sound, which appealed to me. And I, when I went in and started writing songs, like the first couple of songs where I wrote World Peace and Life of My Own, I was just following that lead of just trying to be as heavy and as hard. And, it, you know, I guess today most people would say, you know, a metal direction, but metal wasn't going in that direction at the time. Uh, metal was all hair metal back then. And so I, I was really interested in this idea of just, you know, that's why I love the Black Flag Damaged album and still do to this day. It's one of the greatest albums ever made, but it was just this pure guitar aggression. And that's what appealed to me. It wasn't, it wasn't about having spiked hair or, you know, anarchy or working class, this, or, you know, the social political uh, slant on it. For me, it was purely sonic. Now, how much, how much of your uh, background, uh, for those who don't know, you grew up with a very well-known country father, and he was very involved in recording, releasing records. How much of his impact on you early got you playing music and uh, gave you a probably a much broader idea of music than most people that would play in New York hardcore, how much of his impact laid on you that would be the basis for what we, you start playing at such a young age? 
Well, it was huge. You know, I mean, I think the, the best lesson he taught me was that there's a bigger world out there than the one that you, uh, than you experience on a daily basis, you know, your neighborhood, your friends, you know, he taught me that there was a world that, uh, that I could navigate and I could be a part of, um, not necessarily as a musician, but just as a person, like, he, you know, he never, ever, um, stressed the idea of getting a job. You know, like, I guess most parents were always like, you want to get a job, get out of here. My father never, ever wanted me to have a job. He used to say things to me in a very adult way to a kid. He'd be like, Paris, you need to figure out a way to monetize your talents. <laughs> you know, and there I am like 11 years old going, hmm. He was like, you know, these drawing, you know, because I, I was an artist. I was in art school. I went to the, I went to the high school of art and design with Sean Taggart, you know, uh, who is now a renowned uh, artist. Um, and that seemed to have been my career at that time. You know, I was gearing up to be an art director or a graphic artist or something like that. And my father used to always say, you know, you have to figure out a way to monetize your talents. And um, I think when I started leaning towards music, he kind of like poo pooed that idea. He wasn't, you know, he as a as a record guy, he saw he, 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 saw, he used to refer to musicians as hillbillies. And, you know, he, he would always say, oh, yeah, that hillbilly came by the other day. Oh, that hillbilly was knocking on the door. I was like, who? He goes, Johnny Paycheck. <laughs> you know, and that's just the way he, he thought about them. So when I started going, leaning towards playing music, he, he wasn't, he wasn't supportive uh, in, in a verbal way, but he did things like he was the one who pressed the age of coral cassette for us. You know, if you ever looked at the back, it's got a Nashville address and that was his address. He produced that for me. He got it mastered and, and, and pressed and, and uh, and he made, just made sure I had a product of this thing that I was proud of at the time and published the songs and and that kind of thing. And I, I don't think he really recognized the impact the band was having until one day he called me up. This must have been like, you know, around the time Best Wishes came out. And my father, being in the music business, being a music publisher, he would always go to these little uh, mom and pop record stores and buy bootlegs of songs that he published so he could, you know, they would, it would be evidence in court and things like that. So there he is standing at the counter with a stack of records, you know, Charlie Parker, uh, my father recorded Charlie Parker, uh, Paycheck, you know, Jeannie C. Riley, all these artists that he had discovered and recorded. Not, he didn't discover Parker, but he recorded them. And he said, uh, he goes, so he's on the phone with me and he's like, so yeah, I was at, I was at the trader, I think was, was the name of the record store. And he goes, and there was this little cutie behind the, the counter with, blue hair <laughs> and she was and and I put down my records and then when she was ringing them up I realized that she was wearing a Chromex t-shirt <laughs> and I said yeah and he he said so I said to her I said you know my son is in the Chromex and he goes you know what she said liar she said <laughs> she she yelled at me liar you're lying the Chrome the guy from the Chromex isn't your son and and he goes, that's when I knew that you guys had made an impact because she was mad. Fucking fantastic. He, he goes, he goes, she was invested. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, it seems like a lot of a lot of our fans are are invested um, and, and, and their emotions run high. You know, you touched on it in the beginning that, you know, John has his what he has to say and it ruffles feathers or whatever. And, you know, he's just doesn't think before he speaks and, and, and whatever Harley is, is going on. And, and it seems like there is a division even amongst the fans, you know, people decide that what, what they want to believe and they follow it and, and they don't just follow it passively. It's uh it's a uh, very, very emotional, you know, it, it's, it's just like anything, religion or philosophy that people take on in their lives, you know, if anybody challenges that they feel challenged personally. And, and I'm, I'm really astonished at, at how personally um, people take a record that I made so long ago that I even have a hard time connecting to. And if, if you're going to feel proud of something, it's, it's that it's such a bizarre thing that the songs I wrote in my mother's kitchen uh, in, in her apartment on East end Avenue in New York, when I was 15 years old are making people mad today. I mean, there's definitely a Team Harley, Team JJ, and that and that brings the interest in you up because of the fact that you not only managed to 
come into hardcore at such a young age. I know you you were a year were you a year younger or a year older than Harley when you met him? Older, I think. I, I mean, when I I guess I guess I was probably fifteen and he was thirteen, something like that. Yeah, I know you guys are real close in age, and you had brought up skateboarding, and it seemed like the the dramatic landscape of the LES at that time was like it was a place where a 13 and 15 year old could link up and drink beer and go into a, a place to see shows. And that doesn't even, that doesn't even, it's not even a concept in the, in the American hardcore landscape now. And I mean, I the, the, the thing, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the, the no. thing that's more significant is not only could you uh, get a beer and see a band, but you could form a band and play in clubs with adults. Cause you know, normally you have to be of drinking age to perform in a nightclub. But in New York City, there was this there was this culture of lawlessness. Nobody was enforcing anything. The drinking age was 18, but nobody ever checked for IDs. So we were not only able to go into those clubs, but because, as a result of, of young kids being able to form bands and perform, this entire youth culture um, formed in New York City that, that, you know, once the drinking age changed to 21, completely died in New York. You used to buy the Village Voice, which was the where the band listings were, where you know who was playing on the weekend. And it used to be like five or six pages, full pages of this big magazine of all the bands that were playing. You would, you would, uh, hold on a second. I got somebody calling me. I'm going to end it. Decline. Um, um, yeah, this, this whole youth culture had developed and you had this phenomenon that, you know, subsequently hasn't happened because once the drinking age turned 21, um, literally you watch the village voice, uh, listings go to almost one page because all the clubs that cater to live music, uh, just closed up because that whole youth culture that was supporting it went away. And, and, uh, and, you know, also by the time people get to be, you know, in their twenties, when they're able to play clubs, then they're off to having jobs and getting married and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, that kind of like festering of the musical culture is is impossible. Like the kind of things that you do when you're a teenager, like me. And you know, I I would come out of school at three o'clock from high school, and Harley would be standing in front of my school, not wearing a shirt, scaring all the kids, and because uh, he didn't go to school. But you know, we were uh, you know we were obsessed. So he was doing whatever he was doing during the day while I was in school, and just couldn't wait. So he would just show up to my school and I'd come out of school and he'd be standing there and we would just go off and either go to my apartment and jam or we'd go, you know, someplace and jam or talk or we'd go to a bar and we'd just endlessly talk about the band. And there was nobody else in the band. It was just us. And for years, we just wrote songs and hung out and talked about it. And, you know, because, again, the, the hardcore scene was was really small back then. It was a really small group of kids and there weren't a lot of musicians. So we didn't you know, there wasn't this whole stable of musicians to choose from. And the metal kids hadn't come onto the scene yet. So there wasn't that to tap into. I mean, once the metalhead kids came around, it was like you had your choice of a thousand drummers and bass players and guitar players. But back then. Uh, when it was just me and Harley starting out, there was nobody. So literally we would just sit in rooms and like face to face and play these riffs back and forth to each other for years. And, uh, and that was all, you know, that's the kind of uh, dedication you have when you're a kid. And we had a goal. We had goals to play in clubs and put out records, which, you know, do kids have that aspiration now? I hope they do, but it was a lot easier in New York city back then when you could, I mean, the, the very first gig we ever played at CBGB's, you know, we had been jamming in the studio. It was me, Eric Casanova, Harley, and Mackie. And I felt like we were ready. So I just walked into CBGB's one afternoon, and there was this guy sitting at the desk. And I just kind of, like, walked in nonchalant, like, looking around. And I, and they had this book on the table. And it was, a, a like, a registration book and a hotel type thing. But it was all the shows that were going to happen. And they'd have, like, a little page, and they would have the headliner written in a box for that date or whatever. And I, and I look, you know, I look down and this guy's looking at me like sitting, you know, neither of us are talking and I just start fanning through the book and I see HR was playing, but there was nothing written underneath it. There were no opening acts. I said, uh, I said, who, who's opening for HR? And he said, nobody at the moment. I said, and I said, uh, 
And I grabbed a pencil that was right there. And I looked at him and I just started writing chrome eggs in the, in the spot. And he's just sitting there like this, looking at me. It's really comedic to think of it now. And I just, with a pencil, wrote in the word chrome eggs and I put it down. And I looked at him, I go, is that cool? He goes, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're in that band with Harley, right? Yeah. I said, yeah. He goes, all right. And I just turned around and walked out and you know, walked down the street or ran into Harley or something. I go, I just booked a gig at CBGB's. He goes, how'd you do that? <laughs> I, said, I just wrote it in with a pencil. And that was it. I mean, and that's, that's how it could have been, you know? And I was like, you know, a teenager, you know, just bold enough to walk in and write my name in a pencil under HRs. And that's, that was it. That's fantastic. There was a venue, um, a smaller venue, two blocks from the main venue to Trocadero, which you guys actually played at in 2000. Mm -hmm. And I was actually seeing the band Maxwell and Penalty and there was like nobody in the room. And I said something to the guy, like we could have bring more people than this. And the guy handed me a handful of like a, like monopoly kind of cards. That's how thick the card is. Like you sell six of these and you bring four bands and I'll give you the date. And he wrote in the book. And uh, as a show booker now, there is someone who they say holds the calendar. So as you're talking about this, it's like, obviously we do everything with Excel sheets now, but at one time, even when I first started booking, there was literally a formal book and it like sat by the door with the guy who ran the show. And it's amazing that that exactly happened to you guys. I feel like what you talked about youth culture is insanely important. It's something that I said in a different podcast, I'm sort of over the era where we're talking to guys in their late twenties about their next record, because by the time a, a brain is already focused on what they're doing, the energy sometimes is lost. And, and there's something special about that age that you're talking about 14, 15, 16, where you really don't feel you have an unfettered mind. You want to conquer the world. You have these grand ideas and there's no logistics because it's just, if there's a will, there's a way. And I feel like so much in New York hardcore specifically, no, I mean, it's, it shouldn't have been such a fertile ground, but like, you know, like they say, like a rose will always grow in the middle of a sidewalk. Like it, it's always going to happen. And I feel like that is exactly what happened in New York hardcore and you guys, I don't think if you guys were 10 years older, if you guys could have done what you did. I, I agreed. I, I don't not know if, if necessarily youth is the key, but the, um, the freedom, the freedom of it is, is what's significant. I, and I, and I think the restrictions of, of, you know, having responsibilities and having a job and a family and all that kind of thing definitely plays a role in restricting that. I think that is why to a large extent um, that I had that kind of freedom again, when the pandemic started, you know, I've been working, you know, 13 hours a day, five days a week on TV shows and movies for the past 20 years and sleeping the entire weekends away because I'm so exhausted. And I, I, I just didn't realize how, how little time I had until the pandemic hit and literally my work stopped like that. Boom. And all of a sudden I was, you know, 15 years old and had no responsibility but getting up and watching TV and eating cereal or whatever. And then I, um, I just singularly focused on um, making th this song in this video. And I feel like, you know, because the other thing is, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're before, when you're putting out your first album, all those years that lead up to it, it's all that, that we just talked about all that, like, you know, unlimited, uh, unrestricted uh, fervor and belief, self-belief and belief that you can conquer the world and just spending every minute you have of every day when you're not in school or whatever, writing music. And so you have all these years that lead up to that first album. Like the first album is the result of like an entire lifetime. And then the second album is just the result of the year after that, which is, is really tough for a second album. But, um, now with the agros, I feel like it's really like my first record because I, I had such a long time off and I had this, the freedom of this, you know, 10 month long pandemic where I did nothing but focus on my music. And, and, uh, so I really feel like chaos magic is, you know, even though I'm, you know, a mature musician who understands how to construct a song, um, it really it really came out from just 
doing exactly what I wanted and doing and and just trying to harness the fire of my love of music and just doing exactly what I wanted. And also that's why I did it as an instrumental because I just wanted it to be my singular voice and I don't sing. So that's why I did it that way. But it's not like, I, I don't, I, I, one of the most things I'm gratified about the song is that almost nobody mentions that it's an instrumental, you know, if you get, and also it's like six and a half minutes long. And I, you know, if you, I mean, when I first posted the video on YouTube, I toyed with the idea of taking the comments off because I just, this whole phenomenon of people on the internet, just saying terrible things all the time for no good reason. And then bickering with each other. You see like these threads where like people are like going on and on, like 50 comments, like where two guys are like, fuck your mother. And like, and they're talking about music. I just, I didn't want that to be connected to the, to, to whatever I was putting out. But at the very last second, I was like, "Yeah, what? You know, it's not like it'll be. It'll, it'll. You know, people are going to do say what they're going to say." And to my astonishment, here we are, three months later after I released the video. And if you look at the thread, just like nobody's arguing, there's nobody bickering with each other, and nobody said that the song is long or that the song doesn't have vocals on it. And I, that was the. To me, that was the most success I could have had, you know, nobody bickering, nobody pointing out that the song is long and, and or that it's instrumental, just everybody just being very positive and supportive. I mean, I, you know, after all these years of not putting out music, you, you never know how people are going to react, especially when you're fighting nostalgia. Nostalgia is a undefeatable foe. So, you know, I didn't go in. I knew I'd be going in facing that you know, from Chrome Mags fans. But uh, I also know that uh, when you make music, you make it for yourself and you're hopefully making it also for people who never heard the Chrome Mags. Uh, so uh, I'm very gratified at the response. I mean, you have a right to feel gratified. I find that you are in a very difficult scenario because you're not only dealing with exactly what you said, the nostalgia, but you're, you're, you know, if you're a fighter, they'd be saying you're knocking off ring rust, but also you have, you've got an open road in front of you. Do I write, do I write specifically to say I'm in a different page than I was, you you know, like the, the, the whole gamut of questions of what you wanted to write. But I think what you touched into is a lot of what the people who don't give a fuck about personalities within the, the band itself, they wanted to hear that music. They wanted to hear that aggression and I and that's a perfect balance. Like there's a, and and you're right about the six minutes. I at first when I saw the, the track, I was like, all right, maybe there's like two songs. And I, I realized no, it's just exactly that. It's it's like um I'm a big fan of Metallica and I'll tell you uh that song when Master of Puppets Orion, it starts out very opening and then it, it's very aggressive. And it, it's one of their best tracks on that record. And there's no there's not a lyric thing and it's the same way. And I think if you would have had anyone sing on it, you would have taken away from what you did, you know? And that's the, that's what I've heard back. If a VPAC, when people have said like, Oh, what do you think? I'm like, I think some people have been waiting 20 years for this. And I, and, and you can hear it, you know? I'm, I'm very gratified to hear that. Cause I, I feel to a certain extent, like I didn't try to do anything. Um, I didn't try to do anything. I literally just played my guitar until I, played something that I like, which is what I always did. And if it rings familiar to people, well, that makes perfect sense because, you know, if they like the Chrome eggs, they, that, that just, you know, part of who I am. But um, I did, I do always try to do something musically surprising. Like if I, I don't want to write the same song over and over and over again. So, you know, my approach to writing some of the riffs, like the, that, like that one riff that, takes you from the intro into the song that -da 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 -da. I was like, when I played that the first time, I was like, I've never heard anything like that before. Uh, I got to push this. And I, and I just kept playing until I made it not just kind of like this novelty thing that I'm sliding the chord around to make this crazy aggressive sound, but it also has to be melodic within that. So it's like, -da 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 -da. you know, so it's, it, it actually is very melodic. And then when you hear it with drums, I was really, gratified when I heard it with drums because it was it made a lot of uh, sense musically and it takes you it took you out of the intro like 
like a smack in the face. And then, and then when the song restarts, you know, I, when I, I really, when I realized how big the song was getting, I realized I had to pace it in a certain way for it to, you know, like a movie, you know, every story that people, people understand the pace of a story um, from experience, you know, we watch television shows and when the screen starts to wiggle, we know it's a dream sequence. I mean, we, that doesn't happen in life. We've been taught that, you know, from watching Gilligan's Island, we know that's a dream sequence. And we're, we're taught the pace of a story and a movie. That's why, you know, if a movie is two hours and 45 minutes long, everybody says, Oh, it felt long. That's because they're used to an hour, a movie that's two hours and 10 minutes long. So I knew that I was, um, facing uh, an obstacle by making my song, you know, six and a half minutes long, because after three minutes, people start to get antsy. But um, the the example you just brought up of Metallica's uh, Master of Puppets, to me that I, I definitely didn't use that as a model, but it's always something that's in the back of my mind that I feel like Metallica failed when they stopped making the music for themselves and, and, like they, their songs used to be these journeys that began and then they went, took someplace else and they didn't care how long the songs were because that's what it took to make the journey complete. And uh, that's what I felt with chaos magic. I, I never got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm at five minutes. I got to stop now. I, I hearkened back to rush and yes. And Metallica and these bands that had these songs that were a journey. Cause I certainly don't want to write my music for uh contemporary, uh, expectations you know if you read all this stuff about marketing and, and the way people perceive things on social media they always say if you don't get them in four seconds you lose them i i i can't that can't be my model my, my model for the way i make my music has to be uh have i completed have i made a complete journey uh did i draw people in did I make them experience it the entire time, not thinking about anything else, but what, where they are at the moment. And then when it ends, they feel a, a, a sense of completion. And I know that that probably sounds like it's overthinking it, but you know, I'm in the film business and that's what we do. We, we tell stories. So um, I felt like I, I, I told a complete story with chaos magic. And I definitely thought about master puppets uh, when it was done, because I, I feel like Metallica, I wish they would take take me on those journeys again instead of, you know, give me five, give me two, give me five, 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 whatever yeah. that song is. It's like writing, trying to write pop songs instead of taking us on the journeys, these amazing journeys that they that they did with uh, Ride the Lightning and Master of Puppets. So I'm, I'm I'm definitely trying to do that kind of thing, and the, I'm I'm kind of struggling with the next song I'm going to release. One of them is also like six and a half minutes long, and I don't want that to set the tone, so I might just put out a shorter one because. Uh, so it won't be a pattern. One of the things that I immediately fell into when I did my first episode was someone saying, hey, I know that, you know, Joe Rogan has really long episodes, but you might want to break these up and like do different parts in 45 minutes. And I'm like, we're talking exactly like you're saying, like a conversation that we have on here. It tells a great story about a person and it's going to go up and down. And I feel like parceling things out or, or you know, truncating it for commercial value eliminates the depth that you get. And I, I actually did an episode with one of my closest friends who was in a band with me. We had a four and a half hour podcast because there was a snowstorm and I'm talking to him from London. And I was like, fuck, no one's going to care. No one's going to listen to this. And everyone was like, this is the best episode. I'm so happy you guys went there. And I feel like that is exactly, especially I'm, I'm, I came from heavy metal. Like before I fell in love with hardcore, my mom booked metal bands. I found thrash Metallica, um, and, and me, the one thing that metal has always done a little bit better than hardcore was have the avenue to influence with different, uh, whether it's instruments, whether it's different ideas on songs, it's not in a smaller box. And, you know, when a new hardcore record comes out specifically lately, there's very few times that you're like, oh shit, they went somewhere different, you know? And that's why a lot of times the newer metallic stuff, I end up listening more than, the modern hardcore releases. And I find that with when you listen to chaos magic and especially if you have the opportunity to watch it on YouTube, like I heard it in a link and then I actually like spent time on watching it. It's a culmination of all your like polymathic interests, you know, whether it's art, camera work, you know, it's still you, you know, like it's a very interesting presentation. And I think that that's why it doesn't get lost on people, you know, I, and um, 
I'm excited to see what else you do. I find that, especially in a, it, there's another thing that is kind of cool about it. It came out with a, not only a captive audience, but no one even knowing what what's next. So you're not in a situation where you're like, here's our world tour. We're set up. This is you're writing, you're releasing it and people are enjoying it. And I think that's a lot cooler than like, Hey, here's our new record. You'll see me in a 60 day tour. The cell isn't there. You're just releasing this for your own reasons. Uh, absolutely. I, I think I stated early on that, uh, you know, people kept saying, Oh, why aren't you putting out an album? Well, you know, what's the story with the tour? And I said, well, the, it's, you know, this is not a commercial venture. Um, I'm not on a record label timetable. You know, the, the album format, although we're all used to it is really just a way for, um, you know, a corporate entity to package something so they could manufacture and sell it. And, um, uh, and they do the they do that whole album cycle thing and album cycle touring um, thing to uh, to keep um, the band on a regular schedule for making a profit, and it's just something we've become all used to. And that's the only obstacle I've uh, encountered is that you know the whole press machine, the whole uh, PR machine is all uh, they're they're in that groove, they're in that rut. Um, not necessarily a rut, but that's just their routine. And they don't really understand when they get contacted. Hey, this guy just put out a song and people are digging it. Why don't you write about it? They're like, when's the album coming out? You know, they, cause they just have this knee jerk, knee jerk reaction of, uh, of how to respond. And, 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 and when you answer that question, they know what they're going to say next because it's their routine. It's like when you go to, <laughs> I always say, it's like when I go to Cracker Barrel and I order the apple pie and I tell them no uh, ice cream. Yeah. And uh, and the waitress brings me my apple pie with a spoon. Instead of a fork, because they usually put ice cream on it and you use a spoon. And but she didn't use her brain and say, oh, he's not oh, yeah. ice cream. So I'm going to bring him a fork. They, there's no room for thought. There's just routine. And <laughs> there's really no difference from the people that work at Cracker Barrel. And uh, a lot of the people that I've encountered who, uh, you know, in the press, in the larger press, uh, the commercial press. And so um, when you when you mentioned that uh, that I'm not doing it as a commercial venture, that, that's the only obstacle I'm, I'm, I've gotten. But, you know, it really it doesn't change how busy I am because people who are really on the pulse of this kind of music like you uh, don't seem to take that kind of thing into consideration. It's just it's just about having a conversation with a like minded uh person who is part of the same thing, which is oh, something I always appreciated about the hardcore scene. So when, when we think about like, uh, just throughout the entire story of Chrome Ags, uh, that's like funny. Chrome... I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I got this at Cracker Barrel. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> we got one. We're, uh, Philly has one outside the city. We were hitting it a couple times, but I feel like it was one of the only places that could have breakfasts. So at, uh, at, at exit seven. Yeah. And that's the thing is, so now with that specifically, the time to get there keeps getting earlier and earlier. So we, we abandoned ship on Cracker Barrel. What uh -huh. I was getting at, um, commercial, commercial success is something that has become formulaic and no longer organic. And it, even at the lowest levels within the hardcore scene, the people who are involved in press and PR, they're on the exact same wavelength where they're mimicking the mainstream model because the whole fake it till you make it thing. And what happens is a good bit of what comes out of the underground is organic. It doesn't have a cycle. And I find that what you we've touched on this as well is the two and a half year record cycle has actually killed so many artists abilities to write musically in any kind of creative function, because you're no longer creating. You're now on a product line and you got a deadline coming to you and they're writing. And then, what you said about the sophomore record is probably the biggest trope that ruins hardcore bands is that second record, even it still has some of the fire from the first by the time the third record hits, there's no creativity because they've been on the tour cycle, the promo cycle. They've had no time to divest of all that and really tap back into creative sources. And I feel that that's one of the biggest, biggest overall weaknesses in the entire hardcore music is that mm. a band, Either a band can't, like, 
and I don't know how you feel about it, but some of the best bands in hardcore have released one or two things ever. And they've laid on touch versus a band who may have been commercially more successful and productive. They're going to have a wider fan base and, and, and stay on the tour. But artistically, the music is going to have that generation. Like Terror is a great example of a band that we had him on the show and he saw that every three years they might have a record. Then he can say, oh, shit, this this now this group of kids, this is their first terror record. And I find that I, I agree wholeheartedly. I find the entire process to just completely sap out any creativity. And the whole mm-hmm. point of why we listen to this music is for its creative functions, not just to buy whatever comes out next. Yeah. I mean, especially during the pandemic, that whole album tour cycle uh Met, um, model just it isn't relevant at, at the moment and it certainly wasn't relevant for me when when it became time to put out my record all I kept thinking was I did this I'm really happy with it I want people to hear it and that's when I basically looked at it as opposed to the reg- regular model was um, there's this band called Muse and they're they're kind of like a pop band they, they, they interested me for a moment, but I totally lost interest. But one of the things that I noticed that they did was they put out EPs um, periodically, just a few songs. And then at some point along the line, they would accumulate all the EPs and put out a full length. And it, it gave, you know, fans something to hold in their hand. It gave them, you know, it, it didn't make them, you know, wait those astro astronomical uh, astronomically long times like you know remember when we used to wait five years between metallic albums like that kind of thing is crazy and it it seemed like you know you got you know you got a little taste of stuff over time and i just thought that was a great model so and i also want to release music um that i really feel proud of and i and like you said i just have these um artistic uh propensities that I'm a filmmaker I'm a musician I, I I've gotten to the point where I I don't even feel like releasing a song by itself is complete you know because I can make a music video for it so that's my plan every song I release will have a music video and with that model in mind I I think that um if the pandemic ever ends you know I hope we're not fooling ourselves that normal will ever return but if you know say a year from now uh, and I know that seems like a long time, but it's been a year since the pandemic start started. If a year from now I have two EPs out and I have six videos out, you know, I think I'll be positioned in a perfect place to launch a tour if tours are happening and start playing concerts because I absolutely want to and will do that. And uh, but th- this is a way I can um, satisfy anybody who's interested one song at a time and build it. I'm going to like, I'd like to see how that snowball effect uh, w- works uh, mostly just because that's the way I want to do it. <laughs> and because like you said, you know, um, my background is the hardcore scene and uh, we used to always put out demos first. I mean, I almost feel like these songs are demos like chaos magic as complete as it sounds. When I was recording it that day, I, I never in my wildest dreams would I have thought I would put it out. I can't put out something I recorded in one afternoon. You know, I'm used to being in the studio and laying down, you know, eight tracks, four tracks in each speaker. And, and every articulation of every pick had to be incredibly perfect. I mean, there's certainly nothing, uh, there's no mistakes on the record, but, you know, in the past I would have spent a week recording the guitar tracks for that song. So yeah, I, I, I'm just going to do it however I feel like doing it. And I, I'm definitely not soliciting any record labels or anything like that. I did hire Metal Maria. You know Metal Maria, right? Yes. I hired Metal Maria to, you know, get the word out. And that's been great. But even even her, she, you know, she came, she said to me, uh, OK, I can do this and I could do this, but I'm not going to take your money the way I normally would, because I, you know, you don't have an album out, you know talking about that whole method of, uh, you know, following that commercial model. Uh, she said, I know, I could, I know there's a couple of things I could do that will be, be really helpful. And one of the things was she got, uh, you know, the, the music video premiered on metal injection, which was really important. You, you don't realize. Absolutely. No, it really is. It, I mean, I mean, I know it was important to have people hear it on metal injection because they're a relevant uh, site, but the most important thing was having a deadline. 
because I had been working on this video for five months. I mean, I shot shot it for 22 days. And uh, if Maria hadn't given me that deadline, I'd probably still be shooting. Because I just, every time I'd come home and start editing, I'd be like, oh, because initially I didn't have the idea of like riding the bike through myself. I just started shooting stuff. And then I thought to myself, you know, because I came up with the idea for doing the video because, you know, all my life I've been riding my bike or jogging or walking across that bridge. And I always thought, man, this would be the greatest place to shoot a music video. There's like a million spots. And, uh, and over the, the last couple of years, I've been riding my bike. And that's how I was envisioning the, the video. I would ride my bike through and I would stop. You know, I stopped at that spot in the middle where the trains were going under me and I'd be like, oh, this is a great shot. And that shot where the trains are going, oh, that would be a great shot. And so at some point I started thinking to myself, wow, I'm, I'm kind of presenting myself in different times of my life. You know, like that Age of Quarrel Paris and the Best Wishes Paris. I don't know how much that came across to people, but that was my intent. I didn't mean it to be so literal. It was more poetic. I wanted people to kind of feel it as opposed to, um, and I also wanted to pre pre present the agros as a band. But uh, I figured um, um, who I am today or who I've been for the past couple of years, riding my bike and thinking about, you know, I'm in the film business and I'm doing all this stuff, but wouldn't it be great to make a video up here? Like I never stopped thinking about music and all that kind of stuff. I just never had the time for it. So I thought incorporating that aspect of, of the process of me riding my bike and actually seeing myself performing the video the way I envisioned it on my bike. And then I thought to myself, wow, I, it'd be really cool if I rode my bike and swerved around myself. And I thought, how could I do that? Because I also didn't have, I only had one person helping me. A lot of, you know, you do a music video or a TV show or, you know, you have 80 80 people on set, everybody doing a different job. But me and this one guy named Scott, we we would load up this cart with the lights and camera and three guitars and wardrobe changes because I had to, you know, play different characters and the bike and batteries and sandbags, like, you know, all the things that you need to make something. And we would roll, push this cart up the Williamsburg Bridge, which is like a half a mile. <laughs> and then we'd find a spot and we would set up and shoot. And, uh, and literally I would take off guitar and put it on my friend and I would light him and then we would change places and then we would do, and I would shoot it. And, uh, so that's how we began shooting all these little, you know, like the close-ups of my hands, close-ups of the face, close-ups of the sneakers and stuff like that. And then I said to myself, Hmm, how can we do this? You know, where I swerve inside myself. So you know, the camera had to be up really, really high. And the day before I was in my yard, I had this like <laughs> extending pole with a string on it, with a, like a clipper. Yeah, chopper. Yeah, chopper. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. And you extend it like, you know, really high and you clip the trees. And I was standing there talking to my friend who was helping me because he's isolating in my apartment because I have a garden apartment that I rent out as Airbnb. He's living down there. And I said, man, I wonder if we could put the ca camera on this. And he goes, oh, I don't know. The camera's really heavy with the batteries and stuff. It'll probably snap and break. So we went up there one night and we just put a GoPro up on there and we shot a bunch of shots as a test. But a bunch of those shots made it into the video because they just look so cool. And then so we went up there another time and we really carefully did a rig where we like we uh, like clamped pipes all to this extending post to give it some support. And we're like trying to lift the camera up and we get the, the, the this giant camera up in the air, it must've been 25 feet in the air. And if it fell, it would have been a goner. Like I would have lost $10,000. We get the camera, we get the camera all the way up there and we just start clamping it to this fence, you know, so it doesn't move because it can't move because it's got to be this still shot where I stand here, 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 and then do multiple takes. So we finally got it all the way up there. And then we couldn't get the camera remote to work. Oh, shit. So we had to take the whole thing down and we were exhausted by this time. And we went home and we came back three days later, we put the camera back up there, but we, this time we got the remote to work. And, and I just explained to my friend, I was like, listen, the camera can't move. And, uh, and we took the monitor and I walked out on the bridge and we took chalk and we made X's where I need to stand. And then we charted out the path for the bike. I mean, it took an entire night to shoot one of those shots. It was really, really difficult, but really, really fun. And then I would just stand in one spot with the bass and one outfit and then stand in another space with the guitar in an outfit. And, and then after that, I rode the bike 
through the path where in, you know, I saw where the X's were, where I was standing and I just avoided the X's and then spent all the time editing it. And that was just because I had this idea that I wanted it to be my contemporary self witnessing all my ideas for the video. So, like I said, the, the, the deadline for metal injection was very important because I wasn't running out of ideas. I find deadlines to be very important. I think that there's always an extra touch you want. And whether for me, it's whether it's booking the fest or doing this podcast, if I had another, if I had an unlimited time, like, you know, um, and we've over the last, was it now, this would have been 15 festivals. I have it now down to a science. I better have most of the lineup by this day. And then it's just like, you do have some Hail Marys you have to throw or fuck it. We're not going to do it. I, I was actually wondering how you got some of the higher shots. And I was talking to Sonny Hey five, six about it. He's the one who was like, you got to ask him if he was using any steady cam. I didn't realize that you were that involved with the steady cam stuff. And then we were, I was saying, I don't know if you use drone or if you use GoPro. And then um, the other thing, because you're on a municipal bridge that's in use, how hard is it to deal with you're basically shooting this punk rock style, right? You're not doing permits and blocking things off. Right. I can explain it in uh, three words. Defund the police. <laughs> as soon as you say the words defund the police, you know what the New York police department does? Drive away. They go home. Yeah. I, in 22 nights of us being there. And we always shot from midnight until 5 a.m. Because that was the only time, you know, you got because you obviously can't have people in the, in the shots, especially yeah. those super wide shots. But you say defund the police to the NYPD and they go home. And in, in those 22 nights that we were shooting, we did not see a single policeman. And we and like I said, we went up there. We weren't low, low five. We weren't, you know, we, we had a huge footprint carts and light we would be up in the middle of the bridge guitar cases open guitars leaning up against the fence lights cameras 25 feet in the air and if a cop had come it would have been a problem but they never did and oh and you asked about you know the drone it's funny out for for the first couple of months i was trying to enlist a drone operator and i just couldn't get anybody up there and then i finally found this guy who wasn't really a professional and he went up there with me and he kept saying the whole time you know the bridge is made out of metal it's all metal and uh drones lock to gps to be able to control them with the controller so i have a feeling it's not going to be able to fly on the bridge and from what i've heard from other drone operators they not only is it illegal to fly a drone on the bridge but it's also impossible i said well let's try so we went up there and he couldn't get the drone to fly. And we tried for a long time and we finally abandoned it. And I said, well, at least I know you can't fly a drone on the Williamsburg Bridge. And uh, I guess about a month and a half later was when I had the, um, the deadline for metal injection. So I was editing furiously. And again, like all these visual effects of me riding the bike through that astronomically huge uh, edit so many visual effects and color correction. It was just insane. But I was like editing furiously. I'd finally gotten the video to the point where it felt complete the night before the metal injection premiere and my phone rings. And it's one of the drone operators that I knew from a TV show uh, just called me out of the blue. It, it was like six o'clock in the evening. And he said, Hey Paris, you know, do you ever get those drone shots you wanted? And I thought to myself to tell him the story about how we couldn't get the drone to fly. And then I thought better of it. And I said, I said, no, but um, if you want to do it, we have to do it tonight. You have to meet me at 1 a.m. And he said, OK. And it was raining that night like crazy. So we met at the Williamsburg Bridge at, at around 1230. And uh, we went up on the bridge and we set up and he couldn't get the drone to fly. And I was like, fuck, this sucks. And I said to him, listen, can we, you know, I work in a film business where a thousand things can go wrong and everybody starts panicking and stuff like that. The key to that kind of thing is to just stop, assess the situation calmly, and just try to think outside the box. And I said to him, you're telling me that the drone won't lock to the, the, the uh, GPS because of the bridge, right? He said, yeah. I said, then why don't we go off the bridge, onto the street, lock the drone, to the GPS, and then when we walk back up the bridge, just fly the drone Into it. up on the bridge, and then and then see if it'll continue to fly up there. He goes, okay, let's try it. And he went down and it worked. So we shot 
there are there are four or five drone shots in the video that were stuck in. So we shot that stuff until like five in the morning, you know, because the other thing, you know, you got to take into consideration is I have a train in every shot. You know, you watch the video, there's always a train going by and the train going by only lasts for 25 seconds. You know, every time a train goes by, it's like 25 seconds that it's over. And then you have to wait a half an hour for another train. So we would only get, you know, two, two takes an hour in four hours. You know, you only get eight takes, eight 25 second takes for the, for the, every night that I shot, it was really, I made it really difficult by wanting to do that. But so the drone operator had to face the same thing. I said, we're only going to shoot when the train's going by. So we shot until five in the morning. We got a couple of shots. I literally went straight home and started editing, putting the drone shots in. And, uh, and, I, and I finished it with the drone shots, went to sleep. Uh, I mean, first I emailed the link to Metal Maria and then it premiered the next day. So I definitely probably would have kept shooting if, uh, Holy if, shit. Uh, if I hadn't had the deadline. But deadlines are important. I learned that when I was directing music videos, you know, you have someone that says, you know, we're going to, you got to write a treatment, shoot it on this weekend, and you have to have it edited seven days later. And then it's going to premiere on MTV or whatever. And after doing a hundred music videos, you know, I, I realized, you know, there, there's a certain value in being forced into doing something. People always say, oh, I don't feel inspired. My favorite quote is inspiration is for amateurs. I like that. I like that a lot. I find that a lot of what a lot of what you say about the the train just fucked me up because I actually was thinking it, as you're saying I'm going yeah there really is a train in every single shot. How much of what how much of what you were doing when you became a director and you were shooting these videos and just when how much of that just loaned you to the idea of like if I ever get a chance to do my own video again? Or you just or is this something that you popped in like did you have these stash of ideas that would bring into chaos magic or is it just shit that you accumulated just from over the time? You're like, you know, this could work. It, it, that's a, that's a great question because it, it, it is so, um, it, it's like, you, it's like you um, went into my head and asked the question that I, that I would, I would answer as an artist or a filmmaker or a guitarist or anything like that. You're always collecting these ideas for the future you know, reference materials, you know, oh, like I was on a TV show and I shot, I shot with this lens, you know, 20 feet away and it looked really cool or, or, uh, or, uh, you know, oh, I heard a chord in a, in a weird song that I don't even like, like I heard a chord in a Dokken song. I don't even like Dokken, but i never forgot that chord and I stashed it away and one day I'd use it. And I actually, I, I, I was telling this to someone the other day that one of the chords in, in the intro to Chaos Magic is just kind of like this, you know, extended minor chord that you don't usually hear played, but I heard it in a Dokken song in the eighties for this song called dream warriors. It went. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. And I didn't particularly like the song, but I never heard anybody do that. And it sounded so cool and creepy. And I don't think I used it until chaos magic, you know, so 30 years later, I had this thing in the back of my head. And I used it and, and, and I feel like, you know, I, I write down things all the time. I, I love this thing, the app in your phone called notes. I remember when I first saw that on the phone, I was like, oh, that's useless. But that, 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 that's the most used app on my, my phone now. You know, if I get an idea for a lens or where a light could be placed to look good or a certain chord or any, any of these artistic things that I feel like I put in a toolbox and I'll take out one day, you know, when I need that tool, um, I do that. And so all those years of riding my bike across the bridge, I absolutely, like you said, was collecting these ideas like, oh, I'll do it up from this camera angle. And I love the way, you know, when, you, when you're standing at the curve of the bridge, you can see all the, the girders going off in the distance and that'll be really cool. And oh, and the trains going by is the best part. You know, I definitely thought about that. And I, and I had that idea, all those ideas kind of in my pocket uh, for some day. And I actually... I, I, I'm really glad that it didn't work out, but I pitched the idea to my friend, Brian Newman, who's a horn player, who plays horns with Lady Gaga, but he puts out these uh, really great uh, solo jazz records. And I thought, wow, that would be great to do this video with him on the, on the Williamsburg Bridge. And, uh, but it didn't work out. And then the pandemic hit. And then I was like, okay, I'll just do it myself. I'm very gr grateful that I, I was able to do it for myself because 
Um, you know, I am a native New Yorker. Uh, all, part of that is a big part of my music. I mean, and, and who I am as a person. And I wanted the video to uh, be a visual representation kind of, of the way New York impressed me in my life. You know, New York in my youth was a dark city, a very dark city. You know, we didn't have all the street lights. I remember when there would only be like one street light in the middle of the block. <laughs> and, and then I remember one day, like suddenly the city was very bright. And, uh, and it was also lit with sodium vapor light, this beautiful orange light that's, that's still on the Williamsburg Bridge. And it's pretty much the only place where that light hasn't been uh, replaced by LEDs, these horrible white LEDs. And uh, so I definitely wanted to shoot it up there because I wanted it to look like the New York City of my youth. Like uh, I wanted it to look like the Warriors and not uh, Gossip Girl. No, I, I, I feel that you can actually take that look. And you could juxtapose that in any earlier time in New York City, it fits. And it's another kind of like, like proverbial bridge to the old Paris work into the new stuff. For me, I think of New York hardcore and I think of all the shit that you brought into the thing. And you actually mentioned Dokken. That song was on the um, Freddy Krueger soundtrack. That's, That's the only right. reason why I know that. The only reason why I even know that track. And um, despite Dokken not having the big songs, they, they, that guy was a shredder. Like he knew, he knew some shit. There's that video, um, we're stars, and he has a guitar solo in it, and he rips. That was um, iconic, and that's the only reason why I even know that he was any good because I was always dismissive as the Dokken as well. Like, ah, fuck Dokken, they're no good. But that Dream Warrior song, thinking about you got so excited just talking about shots and lighting, and then at the same time you're tracking potential shots and angles the same way you're thinking about uh, minor chords and old songs. Was that always in your mind? Like from the time that when you were first walking around with Harley outside high school, when did you build that kind of like polymathic brain to appreciate, not just like what you're immediately focused on? I know you said drawing, but when did the camera and the art angle and the lot, like when did that start becoming into your head and like part of your visualization of the city? Um, well, you know, I went to the high school of art and design. I didn't go to an ordinary high school. Yeah. I went to a, uh, like a, career high school new york has a lot of them we have bronx science music and art you know the the the, the one that fame was based on we have aviation high school we have all these kinds of things but uh i went to an art high school so and it's odd you know if you if you read the biographies of lots of uh of bands the beatles from from the beatles to so many other bands they all met in art school so it's, it's the funniest thing like everybody wanted to be an artist but uh so i definitely had that artistic uh, foundation. I mean, I have a degree in fine arts. I went, I went on to college and, uh, got a degree in fine arts and film. And so, but it was in, it was in college that I really started to lean away from art and, and towards film. And, you know, it's funny, I, I mentioned this to somebody yesterday because, uh, you know, I do a lot of creative things out of necessity to, to fill, you know, to complete a picture. And in the early days of the Cro-Mags, I, I didn't have to focus on the art part because my best friend was Sean Taggart. Yeah. I mean, we, we were inseparable. And when you have him as a friend, you know, it, it, it was almost like I could forget that I had this, this talent or skill or whatever you, you, you want to qualify being an artist as. And I never had the necessity to make to, to do things like make flyers or create art for the band because I had Sean doing it. So I was already kind of leaning away from art um, anyway, but and and completely towards music. But when I when I started at college, which was you know after Age of Quarrel, before Best Wishes, you know I, I st started loving filmmaking, and my father had bought me this. Uh, old military camera like you know the kind it's like very rugged you take it out in yeah. the battle it's made so you can drop it and pick it up again he bought it at a police auction and he gave it to me as a gift when i just started school and when we went on tour with um uh, age of quarrel i just shot everything you know i just carried the camera around with me and shot everything you know harley being a goofball and uh, doing his funny stuff and uh and john you know walking around you know just it was just ordinary stuff 
I, I like the idea of capturing all this backstage stuff. And I wasn't even sure what I was going to do with it. I just wanted to document it. I mean, that's ultimately why I'm not in the video is because I shot it myself and I wasn't uh, so self-absorbed that I thought, oh, I have to like do a special session where I shoot myself. I certainly, if I could go back in time, I would do that, you know, because I feel like I kind of shot myself out of the that video. But um, but uh, I just shot everything. And I would, I would hand the camera to people. Like Sean Taggart shot a bunch of the, the live stuff, you know, where John does his uh, – is flipping to the audience and and we played somewhere in in Cincinnati and I my brother drove up from Nashville where he lived and I handed him the camera and you know he did his thing and then I guess somewhere at the end of the tour we were near Nashville I ended up staying in Nashville and uh and I had all this footage with me and my brother said what are you going to do with it and I said I I'm not really sure I guess at some point I would like to make a music video or something he goes at some point he goes now now's the time so uh, I had prints made, you know, this was film. Yeah. This, had, and he had a projector. So we actually projected the video on the wall and he took a video camera and videotaped the image off the wall. That's how wow. he did the, the film to tape transfer. And then he had like a very simple editing, um, compu early computer editing thing. And we just sat down and we started editing the footage together. And he said to me, what song do you want to do? And I said, malfunction. And so we put malfunction into the, into the computer and we were looking at the footage and, and, and the sound was coming through the TV, you know? And I don't know what it was, but there was just something about malfunction coming through the TV. It just didn't sound that good. And, I, and my, my brother kept saying, you know, I don't know this. I don't know about this song. He goes, are there any other songs? It's like, sure. We can pick any song you want. And we just started at the beginning. And, um, he goes, and, and immediately, I don't know what it was about the mix or the way the song works or something, but we got to know coming through the TV speakers sounded really, really good. And he immediately was like, oh, this sounds good. He goes, I don't know about the intro. The intro is really long. Maybe we should start so with the song starts. And I go, eh, I don't know about that. Let's just try it this way. So we just started throwing footage in. We edited it. And I couldn't believe how good it came out. And I went back to New York and, and, um, I went, I went straight up to Profile Records and uh, I went up to the, the guy who ran the place or the, the guy we dealt with, his name was Gary Peeney. And I said, Gary, you know, if we wanted to make a video, how would we go about that? And he explained the whole corporate thing about picking a single and, you know, and I, I was like, okay, well, you know, what if some, a band wanted to make their own video? He goes, well, they'd still have to get a, I'm like, oh yeah. And I just took the tape out of my pocket and I handed it to him. I was like, okay, I made one already. And he goes, oh, OK. Um, he goes, I really, you know, I, I got to leave now. I'm on my way to a music conference in Paris, um, but I'll take it with me and give it a view. And I'll let you know what I think when I get back. I was like, OK. So he goes off to this music conference in Paris. And when he comes back, he calls me immediately. He's like, Paris, come to the office. I said, what's going on? He said, you know, I went to this, mu this huge music conference. Uh, conference in in paris and uh we had a booth set up a profile records booth and we had a tv and a vcr there and he goes when i got there i just you know i had the tape in my bag so i just took it and i popped it into the vcr and he said it immediately drew a crowd and he said that crowd did not leave our table for the entire weekend for the wow. entire conference the video because nobody had ever seen slam dancing wow. nobody had ever heard hardcore music and he goes he goes, I love the video. He goes, but everybody commented on the, the video quality. It looks really low res. And I explained to him how we projected the video, the, the film on the wall and videotape it. He goes, oh, that explains it. He goes, he says, listen, I'm going to set you up with an editor and we're going to do a proper film to tape transfer. He goes, but I don't want you to change anything. Just have the editor, you know, cut for cut, reproduce what you did. And then we'll, we'll send it to MTV and see what happens. And so we did that. And uh, MTV immediately put it on a TV show called 120 Minutes, yep. which was, you know, you remember that, the alternate thing. And then to, and to our surprise, around the world, South America, Europe, everything else, they picked it up and put it on regular rotation. You know, of course, that didn't happen in the United States, but it happened everywhere else because nobody had seen slam dancing behind it. It was, it was like this kind of cultural phenomenon that they were getting a peek into, a slice of life type thing. So it was very popular. And then, of course, you know, bands like Anthrax and Wendy O. Williams and people like that started, you know, because when they hosted Head 
bangers ball, they were given, they, they were often given a choice of what to play. And a lot of these artists uh, put our video on there. And the next thing you know, we got added to that rotation and we were put on videos that don't suck. And the video w- was able to have a tremendous impact. And of course the response to me as an artist, you know, if you make something and nobody likes it, you probably just don't do it again. But if you make something and it really has an impact, it, it inspires you to do other things. And that led me into uh, the opportunities like Anthrax contacted me almost immediately. They, oh, we love that video you made for the Chrome X. Can you make one exactly like that for us? And then I made that video of Belly of the Beast. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. And that was kind of like my first professional. Oh, actually, my first the first one I did was Nuclear Assault. Um, who cares wins? Yeah. Uh, how we my mom booked that band back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So I was able to do that. And then, and that actually led to a career like instantaneously, like all of a sudden I was caught up in this thing where I was actually making a living and generating an income, uh, doing this thing that I didn't really know how to do, except for, you know, just like I said, you know, you collect ideas and you, and you trust your artistic sensibilities and, and then the next thing you know, I was, you know, doing videos for Type 1 Negative and Biohazard and Onyx. And, you know, I think it was Onyx Slam was the third video I ever directed. And it was the longest running number one video on MTV ever. Wow. There's a lot to unpack with that. First, that re- that that video was the first representation of Chromax. And I was a huge Headbangers Ball person. Um, very young, Saturday nights. My mom had work. My cousins played Dungeons and Dragons in my house. They were all metalheads. Saturday night, we're watching Headbangers Ball. And the first time I saw that, I um, just mind blown. Because, like you said, we'd seen Slayer. We'd seen all the, you know, the, but nothing had nothing had that. And I, and I felt like, in some regard, you guys set the precedent to add more crowd interaction. Because so much of rock music and heavy metal music wasn't slam dancing and stage diving it was the band and behind fire and swords which i i love but you guys added a raw presentation of what the people did and, yeah and, and 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 that's like what later you'd see i think slayer did a live video a war ensemble but it still didn't touch because they did it all black and white but you see a, like a, a crazy crowd so it's awesome that you had that now i guess you were doing this and like you said you weren't out of college so you had a career you had a band that had a success without even trying because you just were at the right specific time and you guys were doing everything that bands do with a sonic sound that people hadn't heard of. Then you touch the band with this this film and then you have a career from that. Did you what pushed you to finish your fine arts degree? Because you have a you have a bachelor's, right? You know, you got you got a full degree, right? I have a, I have a bachelor of fine arts in film. It, it's funny because when I was in school, I, I, init- I, I did one year of just straight fine arts and then I transferred to the film department and I, I requested like a, a much higher uh, um, class load than they allowed. They actually wouldn't allow me to take as many credits as I wanted because I wanted to do a dual major of film and fine arts. And I, I did that for like the first two years, my, my second and my third year in college. And then they they basically wouldn't let me take enough credits to graduate in five years to have a dual major because I went to I went to SVA for five years. And I was I think I was like, you know, some small amount away from getting two degrees, but uh, which really surprised me because, you know, colleges are profit oriented. I can't believe they didn't want me to just pay more. But, you know, the other thing was I went to college for free. You know, it was the Reagan years. Everybody talks about how horrible Reagan was, but I went to college for free for four years. And my fifth year, I had to pay $2,000, which was amazing. So, you know, I, I was still taking a, 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 a course load that, that was almost balanced with fine arts and film. Uh, yeah, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> So I did get my degree, but I didn't attend school in my last year. I actually, um, in your last year, you're supposed to make a film. It's called your thesis film. But I was like already in the band and we were touring and and I was already starting to work as a cinematographer. I had shot as a, as a director of photography. I shot, uh, you know, uh, flotsam and jetsam videos, uh, Saturday nights, all right for fighting. Uh, I, I had shot gangrene videos, 
uh, born to rock. And, you know, I had already started doing that. And, uh, I, I did, I, and I didn't have a script really, you know, people should never go to film school if they don't have a script. They don't tell you that you should write a script before you go to film school. Cause the whole point of going to film school is to have all these, a- these assets um, of other people and equipment to make, to make your student film. But I didn't do that. So in my, in my thesis year, my last year, I didn't attend class at all. And I went to the head of our department and I said, listen, I'm working as a cinematographer now. And uh, I think you should have a cinematography category instead of just directors. I said, because, you know, cinematography is just as important as directing. And it's probably a more realistic goal for your students than being, becoming a director. So this is what I want to do. I want to submit three jobs that I've done professionally. And you give me my thesis grade based on that. And, and they were just kind of like astonished that I was demanding yeah, this. you were already there. But they agreed. And I turned in, you know, the Flotsam and Jetsam video, Gangrene video, and one other video. I can't remember what it was. And I created the cinematography thesis at the School of Visual Arts, which is still in place to this day. Damn. That's awesome. I think that uh, you touched on profile Gangrene. We actually spoke about this in another episode. And I think it's important because we talked about the lack of giant commercial success for hardcore bands even though hardcore bands were on profile and profile was doing the same kind of promotion and the same sort of work that they would do for their metal bands. They were doing for the hardcore bands that were on profile and you are in, you're the only guest we've had that can actually speak firsthand in any kind of way. What do you think stopped or hindered hardcore from kind of growing at the same rate that some of the metallic stuff at that time that was paired with profile was doing what do you think that what do you think that clause of that was well there's a combination of things i mean profile may have appeared to to have the same promotional machine that you you might expect from bands that got to success but the truth is profile was used to artists who produced records very cheaply because they were hip-hop generally um and so they spent very little money there and then they would usually just make a music video and send it to omtv raps and that was the end of it like they didn't, those bands didn't tour, so there was no tour support. So they didn't have to follow it up with press and advertising all around the world. Uh, it was literally, they would just make a record for almost nothing and then make a music video. And that was the end of that. So they didn't really have the machine to, uh, they didn't know what to do with us. They, they really didn't. That's one part of it. Um, the second part of it is, you know, we didn't stick together. You know, that's the truth of it. You know, it started as this like really tight, small thing. But, you know, and a lot of people that never really thought it would amount to anything and really didn't. It's it's interesting when people have something at stake. Uh, it changes your perspective about how you conduct yourself. And when when the only thing we had at, at stake was, you know, playing a gig on Sunday afternoon for our friends, everybody was great friends but you know we signed a profile we made a record and all of a sudden you know we were on the launch pad and uh instead of everybody looking to each other and saying man we did it you know we we caught lightning in a bottle we found each other and together we made this thing happen and we might actually have a future You know, especially with the wave of metal music pushing us along, you know, we very easily could have just jumped on that wave. But instead of everybody like looking to each other and appreciating, you know, the contributions of the other ones, everybody was just trying to push each other off the launch pad. Like right before we launched. Actually ascended. (laughs) Like get out of the way, you know, like, you know, not everybody doing that. It was just John and Harley. But um, so that was a major part of it. And then. The, the the I don't know I, I really can't speak to those other bands like Murphy's Law you know the only thing I can say about them is they didn't stick together either you know kicking out Uncle Al I mean you don't kick out the guy who writes the songs you know that's why Murphy's Law never made a record like the first one uh, not that that's the reason why they didn't have big commercial success but um, they didn't stick together um, then for us. You know, when it came time for best wishes, there was an AR guy at Geffen who heard best wishes before it came out and he wanted to buy us and put us on Geffen. And, you know, that could have been 
that could have been what would have happened that that could have been the key component to making uh to changing our destiny you know if we had gone and released best wishes on geffen and then followed it up with five great albums and you know did all the things that you need to do to have success that i think that would have been an inevitable uh uh, result which would have been you know the chrome eggs being a relevant popular and successful band but that didn't happen either and it didn't happen for you know ridiculous reasons you know profile records basically let the negotiations for the deal go on and on and on for like a year we you know we postponed releasing the album for a long long time you know hoping that this would go through and then ultimately Gary Peeney, the same guy who took my video to Paris, said to me, he goes, he goes, oh, we were never going to sell you. I said, what do you mean? Why, why wouldn't you? He goes, well, you know, Profile Records is kind of on the cusp. You know, we're really a small indie, but because of the success of Run DMC and Rob Bass, uh, you know, we're being viewed kind of as a major. And if we sell you to a major label and you get successful, that's like admitting that we're not a major label. Wow. I said, are you kidding me? It's that simple? And he said, yeah. And, and you know, soon after that, I quit. And um, John and Harley, all those guys, they, they, they sought to be released from the record contract. And uh, I actually saw this contract the other day because I'm going through some legal issues and I had to dig up some old papers. But I found the release from Profile that was written for everybody in the band but me. And it said, uh, you are all free to go and you can do whatever you want. And you can even perform as cro which is so insane because they wouldn't sell us. They could have made some money selling us the Geffen, but they Absolutely. were willing to, they, but they couldn't do that because of the way it would look. And then um, they let all those guys go. And the, 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 one, um, the, one, the one aspect of the, the contract that uh, was, um, to, to release them was as long there can be a Chrome mags out there making records, as long as Paris and Harley do not appear on it together. Once Paris wow. and Harley appear on a record together, then we own it again. So th that's why Harley was able to go off and do his alpha mega record with all those other Chrome mags with Doug and John and, and Harley, those three guys were out able to make alpha mega because I wasn't on it. Wow. And um, yeah, they would later eventually, John would do no near death experience without Harley. And then Crow Mags would come with revenge. And I guess it just fucked me up thinking that that was the barrier. They didn't at, at a presentation, they didn't want to lose. And that actually ties back into what I said in, in the same episode, the rise of hardcore came because punk had seen like it was in a dying breath, so to speak, the 77 punk, et cetera. So you guys ramp this shit up and you make something completely unique for the moment. And you specifically, now we're going like way deep here. You know, we talked about rush. You were taking obviously what was going on inside when you were thinking about doing Chromax for Harley, but you, the approach which people have always said, it's kind of a juxtaposition of Harley's interesting, chaotic, like strumming technique of the bass, very aggressive with you having fast metallic chords involved with like a punk structure almost. Mm -hmm. Were you guys cognizant of that plan or what were you like, what was the basis for that when you guys were writing the very beginnings of these songs? I mean, not to diminish Harley's bass playing. He's a, he's a, he's a good bass player, but that performance comes from the songwriting. You know, it, you know, I've heard people say, oh, I love Harley's bass playing, man. The intro to World Peace is incredible. Yeah, but I wrote that. And he just played it the way I showed it to him. So that picking style was certainly mine, without a doubt. I mean, you could hear it when you, like you, you were actually mentioning when uh, you watched the playthrough of Chaos Magic. Yeah, the, the ease open the whole time and you're actually on the other side. And then you, you, you know, I watched it and I'm like, all right. That's just a continuation of world peace, which, you know, is, you know, I can't even claim that for myself because in my mind, you know, when I was 15 and I wrote world peace, I was trying to play like Lemmy. You know, I, I, I've, 
I've said many times that uh, all those songs on Age of Coral is the left hand is Rush and the right hand is Lemmy, you know, because a lot of people, when they approach music, they approach it in some kind of method. A lot of people use the blues pentatonic box as a method. You know, they pick up the guitar and you see like you can you can trace their hands just playing a pentatonic box. Like even even Slash, you know, when he does a solo, you can you can watch his hand. You could see the pentatonic. You know, that's some people's point of reference. But for me, I didn't I didn't know music theory. I just knew Rush and Van Halen and all that kind of stuff. And I, I didn't really spend a lot of time playing their songs, but like whatever riffs I knew, I would kind of repeat those patterns and write my own songs to them. I mean, the, the song um, Signs of the Times is is Bastille Day by Rush. You know, I remember like hearing uh, the All the World a Stage album. And there's this, you know, the, the intro to the either Bastille Day or Anthem. Um, I remember thinking, God, he's only playing one chord. He's playing the high and then the low. And it sounds so cool. I mean, everybody thinks like these guys are these virtual musician, virtuoso musicians, but he's playing this such a rudimentary part. But it sounded so great. So I thought, you know, like, I'm going to play that same riff, but backwards. Instead of going, dan, 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 I'm going to go, dun, dan, 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 dan. and so I was playing that a little bit, but I didn't really like the rhythm of it. So I figured, how would Lemmy play it? So I went, dun, dan, 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 dan. and then I had signs of the times. Dun, dan, 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 and then the chorus part, dan, 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 is Cygnus X1 book two from Rush, which goes bam, 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 bam. So I just went bam, 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 and that's uh, the chorus to Science of Time. Not not the chorus. Uh, bam, bam, it's the verse. Bam, 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 bam. So I mean, they're not exactly Rush songs, but that's where I heard it. And again, you know, I wrote those songs on the bass. So when you hear them performed and you you think about that bass style, it just comes from the songs. You know, it comes from the songs that were the foundation for the the sound of the band, which was the first, the very first Chromag song was World Peace. Now, when you when you started playing, there's not obviously what we have now as far as media and, you know, zine, even zines were very far. So it was like newspaper writings and, you know, we only have what people remember people say. This is all hearsay. Were you guys initially seen as like metallic or punk or both? Like when you were hearing people opinion about the music for the very first early stages, what was the uh, feedback? I mean, the, the metal scene hadn't, kind of uh, uh, caught on to the hardcore scene yet. Yeah. So there wasn't that perspective yet. It, it was really only just hardcore people. And the hardcore people were, you know, that transition out of the punk rock. You know, the scene initially in New York was punk. You know, it was the leftover people from the punk. Everybody was drawn to the Sex Pistols and all that kind of stuff. And that's was the appeal of the, the stimulators. The stimulators were basically a Sex Pistols clone band. Uh, you know, the singer looked like Johnny Rotten. He did all of Johnny Rotten's poses. And, you know, they were kind of like a Sex Pistols type thing, even though they developed their own their own style and they were great. Um, so, but as a result, you know, all the kids, that youth culture that I told you that were drawn to the stimulators and the mad crowd and all that kind of stuff, they were kind of like all standing in the audience looking up and seeing this cool, this cool stuff. But uh, and they were forming bands because they were able to. And then we started doing basically doing our own thing. And I don't know how everybody else felt, but I felt like I don't feel any connection to this English thing. You know, as much as I love the Sex Pistols, I don't feel connected to that at all. Here we are standing on the dance floor at CBGB's and A7, starting our own bands, having our own little thing going on in this room. I don't, that's why I embrace the, the word hardcore. So when we first started playing, the only people that were hearing it were hardcore people. 
So the responses we were getting were uh, just from that crowd. And it was, it was, in, it was, it was quick. You know, we went from playing our first gig to headlining like in no time, you know, cause again, the, the scene was very small, but it was also during that period of transition where, you know, you'd be standing out in front of CBGBs and, you know, for months and months and months. And then one day some kid pops up like with long hair <laughs> and big white sneakers standing like off in the fridges, kind of like looking around and everybody notices him because we, you know, we noticed anybody knew, you know, that's how small the scene was. If somebody new came, especially somebody who looked out of place, which this, you know, which any uh, metalhead would look out of place. Um, and then, you know, the show would go on and then this metalhead would go in the audience and, you know, test the waters and he'd get lumped up a little bit, but he would tough it out. And everybody would be like, all right, he's okay. You know what I mean? He took his lumps. And then everybody was like, okay, that's really cool. And then next week he comes again. And then next week he comes again. But then the following weekend, there's two of them. And everybody's like, oh, no, there's another one. And then I go, you're okay, that's fine. So they, they go into the pit. They do their thing. They get their lumps. Okay, okay, these guys are okay. And then the next weekend, there's 13 of them. And then the next weekend, there's a hundred of them. And then the next thing you know, at our shows, the hardcore crowd was the minority, at least at our shows. Because we, 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 we went from CBGBs to the Ritz. Yeah, the Rock you know, was Age of Coral came out. We made this jump. Like we were no longer playing on bills with 15 bands. We were playing the Ritz with two opening acts. And, the, and when you looked out in the audience, it was certainly peppered with uh, the hardcore fans, but it was regular kids and a lot, a lot of metalheads. So we rode that wave. And, and I think that, that that's when the, the commentary about, you know, that by this time, you know, it, it became clear that Metallica was he heavily influenced by hardcore. Anthrax had come out with their New York hardcore logo on their, on their merch and stuff. And they were embracing things like moshing and, and the whole culture of it. And uh, so we were suddenly part of the metal press. So that was when that all happened. It all, it all happened in a, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, uh, in an arc, you know, in, in the beginning, it was just our friends, our fans. And then it transitioned into this thing where that was kind of left behind. It wasn't left behind by us. It was just by circumstance, you know, we couldn't control who was buying the tickets and who was writing about us. And, uh, and, and suddenly we were, you know, touring with bands like Motorhead. And then we put out an album like um, Best Wishes. And I, I don't know how much of a concerted effort, effort it was to make Best Wishes more metal. It, it was just that, you know, Harley and I were learning. You know, when we started playing together, we were very new at our instruments. And you can see our learning curve uh, over those years, it was, it was dramatic. By the time we went into the studio to record best wishes, we were completely different musicians and we were certainly influenced by all the things that were around us. And, and of course, as we were playing in front of those metal fans, uh, when we played songs like malfunction and seekers and got these tremendous responses, maybe more than the other songs, because it was something they recognized and could understand and I and could identify with, we, you know, it's like natural selection, you know, uh, the, 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 the successful people in the, in the ecosystem survive. And uh, we could see a direct res, uh, response to the songs like that. So I guess even unconsciously, we started writing heavier, more metal style songs because you walked out on stage and played those songs and people responded to them. And that's really why that happened. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm sure there was a certain amount of consciousness to it. But I think it also is just like a, you know, a natural progression. We were, we're all, uh, we're all affected by our environment. It, no, you're, you guys, you actually touched exactly on what happened. I mean, SSD, there's a list of them, you know, from Boston was SSD gangrene, you know, everybody was seeing the, the rise in metal, which it had the same kind of forebear, like small club, small crowd grow. And I felt I've always looked at it. Obviously I didn't go to my first hardcore show until 1993. And I was this, I was the long hair you're talking about. I was like a very young kid, him get my lumps, come back, come get my lumps. But looking at the whole entire lineage of hardcore in the history, 
at a certain time, and and I loved your perspective on it. It was, hey, here's our crowd. We like people going off. And I mean, what affects hardcore music popular wise now is absolutely that. You know, there's very few times where bands are writing songs musically because they are enjoying what they're writing. The youth culture now is very much, let's write a song that's going to have a massive breakdown or get people to sing along and stage dive. So it's interesting to me that you were seeing it even as early as like 1987, 1988, where you're writing because you want to, yeah, who doesn't want to get on stage and impress the crowd? What the fuck we're here for, right? Yeah. But, you know, like I said, those songs that, that those the metalheads were responding to were, your were written. Songs. Yeah, they were written before we knew to, to cater to them. I just think it was just a natural progression to, you know, you can lean one way or another. I always make the analogy of Van Halen, you know, his first album. They could have gone more atomic punk, uh, yeah. running with the devil, or they could have gone more Jamie's crying, and they went more Jamie's crying. You know, so yeah. we we could have gone more, you know, uh, you know, face the facts, or we could have gone more malfunction, and I think we went more malfunction. I think specifically malfunction is one of these tracks where so much of the so much of the songs have not a dissimilar feeling, but that's the most dissimilar track on that whole record. And live, um, behind me, I have a Chromex thing. And I booked the, the John Mackey quite a few times. And the first time we did them when they were allowed to be called Chromex in 2009 in December. Or it was actually, yeah, it was 2009. When Malfunction came on, I was like, I wonder what's going to happen. And that was like, you would have thought that was like the biggest Mosh song. And having heard, I've seen different iterations. I've seen you guys play it, you and Harley. I've seen JJ do Fearless Vampire Killers, but it was that, Malfunction became like the song that everybody went insane for, which is funny because it's such a slower, groovier song. Mm. Meanwhile, like Face to Facts, Signs of the Times, Street Justice, these these fast metallic riffs also incite people. When you played Malfunction early on, was because moshing isn't at the stage that now, and I know DC brought like the low creepy calling where were they pogo into malfunction? What were they doing when you guys are like, what was, what was the reaction when you guys are playing malfunction? Cause it's so much slower than some of the, the, some of the elements. I mean, I know obviously the mob and different bands had like a slow down part before the fast part, but I also know at that stage, the fast part was the mosh part for a lot of early hardcore. I'll tell you, I don't think the song malfunction stuck out that much back then because there was, there was no model yet. There was no template. Uh, all the bands were very vastly different. You know, I always say, you know, if you if you take if you take like the great bands of the area, Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, Bad Brains, uh, uh, Misfits, you know, Circle Jerks, whatever, and you and you try to connect the dots. Like, what is it? What what what? How are the Dead Kennedys and Bad Brains similar? How are the Misfits and Minor Threat? similar you know how are the dead kennedys and agnostic front similar they're they're so stylistically they're so dramatically different that it's kind of surprising me that they're even in the same category but that was the 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 power and the strength of the hardcore scene it was like this explosion of creativity you know everybody was just doing their own thing and you didn't have to fit into this box you just had to kind of somehow like be great and interesting and I think when we performed the song Malfunction on stage suddenly, because it was one of the later songs uh, that I wrote, um, I don't think people responded to it any other than it was just, it might've been like a place for them to take a break. You know, that's, I, 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 I was going to actually mention that when we were talking about Chaos Magic is that when I wrote that, I, I really tried to put myself in my shoes, in my vans that I was wearing when I was, 14 standing in the audience and CBGBs and what I wanted to come off the stage, what I expected to come off the stage, what I'd be surprised by coming off the stage and, and how I would react. And I knew I would be going crazy for certain parts. And I also knew that like I needed a break, you know, so I wrote parts in there that I felt like were almost a break, a rest. And then I would bring the fury back full and then take a little, give you a little time to relax and then come back, you know, it, it, it was, I paced it intentionally. So you weren't just burn out. You would, you'd be, you'd be given a time to breath and then come back and take a time to breath and come back. And, and I think malfunction served that 
purpose in a set as opposed to, you know, as a component part in a song. And uh, when we first started playing Malfunction, I mean, it's funny that you say it's so different. It is different. I mean, I wrote that song on an acoustic guitar. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I you always say, you know, if a song doesn't work on the acoustic guitar, it's probably not any good. But uh, I wrote that on my acoustic guitar that's back there. That my, my Martin D28 that I've had all my life, 1958. Um, you know, I, I always say that... Every time I pick up that guitar, I think about malfunction. I feel connected to my instruments. Um, I think I have a relationship with my instruments that's different. Uh, maybe not different than musicians who write songs and songwriters, but maybe different than someone who just plays guitar. Because every time I pick up my Red BC Rich, I think of, you know, Show You No Mercy. And I remember writing it. I remember sitting in my mom's kitchen and with two dual cassette player and like recording one part and then playing over it and trying to make it double track and stuff like that. But I never, ever pick up that, uh, my Martin acoustic without thinking of malfunction. I never pick up that guitar without thinking of, you know, signs of the times. I, I actually, unfortunately I wrote signs of the times on a GNL bass that was stolen at a gig. So Damn. I really feel bad about that, but yeah. Um, so when I, when I, it's funny, there's a story, there's a story that goes with malfunction. That's interesting, which is I had written the song and, uh, it was, you know, we hadn't even recorded the demo yet, but Harley and I were already not happy with John and Mackie and we were, we wanted to replace them. And we had begun talking with Roger Moret and Petey Hines. And so we had a, uh, like a clandestine, uh, jam where uh, Petey and Roger and me and Harley met at a, re at a rehearsal studio. And uh, my, feel my feeling about, you know, trying out new musicians is like, I didn't want them to come in and play world peace and show me that they could do it. I knew they could do it. Uh, I wanted to see how they would groove on a brand new song. And I had just finished Malfunction. So I brought that in and that's how we did kind of, I wouldn't call it an audition. It was just a test. And we, 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 we played, you know, we played life of my own and world peace and all that kind of stuff, but we spent most of the time playing Malfunction. And it was awesome. You know, it was, it was great hearing that song. And Petey was totally into it. He was like, this is like a metal song. I love metal. This is going to be. And Roger was totally into it. Roger was going to quit Agnostic Front. Petey was going to quit Murphy's Law. That was the plan. And then after the rehearsal was over, you know, uh, me and Harley walked downtown to the Lower East Side. And I think Roger and Petey drove in Roger's van. And we met downtown. And uh, I met up with Roger and Petey and I said, okay, you know, me and Harley discussed it. You know, we're, we're, we're down, we're going to do it. And, uh, Roger said, uh, yeah, we don't, we changed our mind. We don't want to join. And I said, really, yeah. why not? I said, why not? He goes, I mean, to be honest with you, we love that new song you wrote, man. That fucking song is great. He goes, but we just don't want to be in a band with Harley. I said, okay. They said, you know, they're both sitting there looking at me and they go, but we really love that new song of yours. Uh, so why don't we just start a new band? Just me, you and Petey start a new band. And um, I just remember thinking, you know, what do I, what do I really gain out of that? You know, the Chromex wasn't a band I joined. The Chromex was a band that was my band. Started, yeah. It was my songs. So I, I, luring me out of my own band to start a new band just it didn't make any sense to me at the time it was like this la weird lateral move i would be would i would have been rid of mackie and john and and if believe me if i would known how things would have turned out later i may probably should have taken that lateral move but at the time it didn't make any sense so it didn't happen so you know every time i pick up that guitar and i think of malfunction i think of that day and I think of the, you know, the thousand times I played it live and, you know, it, there's such an incredible feeling of gratification to play a song on stage and look out and see like a sea of people moving to something you wrote on an acoustic guitar in your mom's kitchen. Now, you guys, you guys really did play at some places early on that might have been the size of someone's mom's kitchen. And then later on, especially in the. Um, the stages where Europe Fest were getting big. I seen some giant pic, uh, some giant videos, and then you're standing out in a crowd that was bigger than some of the parts of the Lower East Side. And it's got to be interesting to think of 
the the progression from point A to that. And I wonder how much ac- uh, how much exposure to that other world made you just happy? Because I feel like some people are happy when they get in front of a crowd like that, and other people are thinking like, we need to make this an everyday thing. Like, did you feel content being able to play in front of them giant Euro stages and be like, holy fuck, look at all the people that love this? Or were you kind of like, we need to go further? What kind of like people usually set in one path or the other? Interesting question. You know, there's a there's an old interview with me and Harley sitting backstage at CBGB's, and th- they're just asking us questions like, you know, because we were so teeny at the time. And they were like, oh, you know, what do you see as the future? You know, do you, do you ever imagine you'll ever make a record or maybe even tour someday? And I, and it's funny just to see like, you know, 16 year, 17 year old me going, yeah, man, we're going to play Madison Square Garden. That's the plan, That's you know? Cool. And then of course, you know, but Harley's ambition was to like be as big as the Bad Brains. And I remember saying to him, big as the Bad Brains? No, we want to be as big as Van Halen, you know? <laughs> You know, because it, it, it goes back to what you said about, you know, not have, being fearless and being a kid and not knowing that there's any boundaries. So as, as things started to actually ramp up, you know, in whatever direction, you know, it was certainly just up, you know, sky's the limit. We didn't really know how far it could go. And then we hit all those obstacles of like not being able to be purchased by Geffen and not sticking together and, you know, having lots of starts and stops and starts and stops. And I mean, if you don't have that traje- uh, trajectory of going straight up and you do that start and stop thing, you just never get the momentum back. And, and we never, and we never did. And um, we broke up well before the whole festival phenomenon happened. So it was never part of my, uh, it was never part of my consciousness about or connection to the band. It wasn't until we put out Revenge years later or leading up to Revenge when we, when we played the Dynamo Festival. Yeah, that's the video. That's the video. And that, I mean, that, that it's, it, it, I don't think I ended that day thinking, Oh, this is the way it's gotta be all the time. I really kind of felt like we didn't even have a record out when we, when we played that show, we played the main stage at Dynamo on a demo. You know, me, Harley and I backstage were actually joking around. I said, Harley, when you go up to the, when, you, when we walk out on stage, you should walk up to the microphone and say, so how many of you people have our demo? You know, because it was just such a joke that we were playing the main stage. So I, di- I didn't feel like I certainly didn't feel like we had earned uh, that position, even though Andre, the guy who uh, put on the Dynamo fe- Festival, felt that way because he, you know, the Dynamo Festival at that point wasn't so much a commercial uh, thing. It was really Andre's thing. It was the bands that were on the bill were the ones he wanted and that kind of thing. So uh, he chose us to be on the main stage and it was just a, a, certainly a surprise. And then once we put out revenge, I think we played, we played in front of like a million people in a month, you know, doing festivals that one summer. And so I, it wasn't routine to me. It was certainly like my life was peppered with these extraordinary uh, opportunities to do it. But, you know, when, when you play a festival, if you can, and, unless you're Iron Maiden and you're headlining and you convince yourself that that massive audience is there just for you, then you're just deluding yourself. You know, we were just part of, of a, of an awesome package and we were happy. I was happy to be there. Um, I think I, 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 the, the whole thing with the misfits headlining and, um, selling out Madison square garden, my 17 year old's, self would have totally understood that but i tell you when i was standing in the audience looking around i was in shock i mean it was such an amazing thing to see the misfits because when the misfits broke up they were playing rooms the size of the stage at madison square garden you know they were never they were never some big band this this was a phenomenon that happened as a as a result of a conspiracy of uh of circumstance you know cliff burton you know cliff burton is the reason that's it Standing on the stage. His tattoo. Of What's that? His tattoo. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, Cliff Burton, you know, people were fascinated by this, that tattoo and his T-shirts. And this guy in Metallica, you know, who was making the noise that everybody wanted to hear because they were, you know, so stellar in that era. And they were interested in this very, like, peculiar introverted guy with his Misfits T-shirt. And they all wondered. And, and it pique the interests of an entire generation of people about a band that nobody had fucking ever heard of. 
And as a result, you know, I'm, it's not to diminish the misfits. The, the misfits belong on stage at Madison Square Garden. If there were ever, if there was ever a band I saw on stage at Madison Square Garden who belonged there, it was the misfits. They were so great. I mean, every one of them, they put on the performance of a lifetime. The songs were incredible. Everybody in the place was singing every word. It was fantastic. When I saw Tool at Madison Square Garden, I walked out. It was so fucking boring. I couldn't believe it. When I saw Run DMC and uh, the Beastie Boys at Madison Square Garden, it was incredible. When I saw Rush and the police, the misfits belonged on that stage. So I, I, wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have been surprised then, but I'd be, I, I was surprised when I was there as much as I knew it was a great thing. So the long and the short of it is, you never know where you're going to end up. You know, the misfits certainly didn't stick together, but they, and they still ended up on stage at Madison square garden and, you know, and, and to lend itself to this, you know, people in recent times, you know, all, all over the years, people have been approaching me, whether it be Harley, you know, sending me nostalgic emails, lovey dovey emails, like <laughs> rush videos that he knows that I'll, I'll like. And so I thought you would like this. He just, which I never respond to. And, uh, and, um, and John asking me to write a Chromax album for him like five years ago. Um, and people just always saying, you know, there's, there's so much money out there if there's a Chrome Eggs reunion. And of course that wouldn't be the interest of me. My interest would be, you know, to be able to play my songs and, and enjoy it and have a great time, which I don't think is possible. That's why I never entertained the idea. But recently, uh, somebody in the business, initiated contact between everybody uh, and uh, we got no further than, you know, agreeing to do a phone call when I ended the, the, uh, the, 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 the meeting um, because there were all these external demands that have nothing to do with the reunion uh, that they yeah, want. I remember to I kind of, uh, I don't, I don't only cut you off cause I want to add to the, what you're saying from, we were involved with sending paperwork because of the disputes and the name and all this. And at one point I had heard through hearsay that one of the things that there was going to make the amicable possibility for everybody to walk away peacefully is if there was the full reunion. And that was like something in the, well, if we can make this happen. Maybe we can make the Cro-Mags name work. And I right. heard that you were involved and that's the first time. Cause I've seen you on Facebook say a million times, I have not an interest in being on stage with these guys. And I, you know, like you, and I've heard you say a million, I've seen you write a million times saying that's not something that you're looking to do. And I, and I actually thought because of the Misfits reunion and the fact that Harley was there, that he had thought, well, if it happened for the Misfits, maybe it could happen for Cro-Mags. And I brought you right back to what you'd said about Madison square garden. And, and as a promoter of a festival, that's done a lot of reunion and someone's been like, you're the one that could do it. I'm like, dude, there's no, there's no getting them all together. I try to tell everybody it's, it's just not plausible. And then I'm just, I'm just going to pause you for one second. And yeah, then sure, I'm sure. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sure. My, good, man. My phone was uh, ah, not threatening. Me, man. Um, not so, uh, what, very big question. Let me just, actually let me just move this. Yeah, sure. The charger. Um, very big question. You know, especially now, you know, the thing that I always got out of being in a band is the... Um, it's the uh, it's the realization of this, the songs that I write, you know, just sitting here and like fiddling around and playing my guitar till I hear something I like, and then showing it to somebody and having them play it back to me. I mean, even that first thing of hearing it played back to me is such a powerful thing. And I I think for a long long time I uh, I confused that joy and that pride of hearing my music played back at me as uh, something that I required, that I required 
you know, th- this, this band, uh, you know, and I always connected that with Harley cause he was my partner. So like, if I, you know, like even the first time we jammed on world peace, just hearing it coming back at me, I was like, Oh my God, this is so amazing. You know? And I attached that great feeling to him. And then, uh, you know, then to make a song like chaos magic and do it all by myself and just hear it coming out of the speakers and having that same feeling, but there's nobody sitting in front of me that I'm attaching that feeling to. I, I began to recognize that, uh, I had attached that positivity towards somebody who was really not deserving of it. Um, so especially now in terms of the timing, you know, I, now I have aggros. I, I get what I need and what I want out of my own music without attaching it to other people. And uh, so I, in the future, I will be playing and I'll do, be doing all the things that I would enjoy being in a band without having to be attached to 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 people that I would have to uh, subvert my, you know, subvert everything to to be a part of, you know, like one of the big parts of uh, the conversation was that everybody admit, you know, uh, for diplomacy reasons to accept a, a portion of the blame for the past. And, and if we all kind of just pretend it was all of our faults and we just agree uh, to do that, then we can move forward. I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm, I can't do that. I won't, I won't do that for a second, not even for diplomacy. And I don't feel a need to do that. I, I, uh, uh, the, the being on stage that you mentioned, that's not the hard part. The hard part is the rest of the time, you know, <laughs> having to associate with, you know, people you don't want to associate with. Uh, and I actually wondered, I was going to call Jerry only and say, you know, how did you guys do it? You know, who, who arranged it? Uh, who is this person? You know, I would like to speak to them if there, if there is some master template for keeping everybody separate and, and, uh, and doing it, you know, and, and this, and, and again, you know, this is only the academics, me going through the academics of how it would work. It's, it really had no, I really have no interest in it, but the reason the conversation came up was about, I don't know, two years ago, somebody presented the idea to me of re-releasing Age of Coral on vinyl. I guess it was more like three years ago. And, uh, and I said, and the guy was a friend of mine who worked at a regular label. And I said, you know, I got to tell you, just save your, save yourself the grief. You know, it's, it's not going to happen. He said, why not? I said, because, because Harley. <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean? He goes, I'll present him with a good deal. You know, he won't have any reason to balk, but it, it didn't end up happening. And then about a year ago, he called me again. He said, listen, I've sweetened the deal. I want to do best wishes and age of quarrel. And uh, I've already spoken with everybody and everybody's in agreement. And it's a really sweet deal for everybody, like a lot of money each, you know, in advance and then a good amount of money, you know, and, and first class pressing and all that kind of stuff. And I said, I said, okay. I said, I'm all in, you know, if you want to do it, that's fine with me. Everybody, everybody treated equally. Like everybody who performed on, you know, there's a separate deal for best wishes and a separate deal for age of quarrel. And all the people that participated on the record will get treated, you know, get an e- equal cut. And I was, I said, that's the only way it could work. You know, I won't even bother arguing any other kind of position. I said, but it won't work. I'm telling you, it won't work. So he goes, why not? I said, because Harley, he goes, but Harley's already agreed. I was like, she- you don't understand. He goes, what don't I understand? I said, let me tell you a story. When we used to go on tour and we would pull, our tour bus would pull up into a gas station or a store. Everybody would always get out of the bus because, you know, you just couldn't wait to get out of the bus. And we'd all go through the store and we'd walk up and down the aisles and pick out potato chips and sodas and stuff and all go up to the counter and we'd get back on the bus. And every, every time we did this, we would go in um, everybody would slowly file back onto the bus. And the last person in the store was always Harley. And, uh, I was pointing this out to our tour manager. I was like, I was like, we got, uh, Harley will, will always be the last person on back onto the tour bus. He's like, what do you mean? I go, what? Watch. Well, next, next stop, next gas station we go to, I'll show you. He goes, okay. So we pull out, we all go into the gas station and we're all walking around the place and everybody slowly files back into the bus except for me and harley we're the last ones in there and so i grab up a couple of stuff a couple of things and i go up to the counter and i pay and harley's at the magazine rack and he's like looking at me 
And then as soon as I, I go, I start walking towards the door, I reach for the door and he puts down the magazine. He starts walking towards the door and I uh, turn around and I go back into the store and he immediately turns back and I, I can see the tour manager in the, in the bus window, like watching. Harley goes back to the magazine rack and he keeps looking. And then uh, I go and I grab something else and I go back to the counter and I pay for that too. And then I go out the door and this time I get halfway to the tour bus and Harley's out the door and I turn around and I'm like, Oh, I got to get something else. And Harley's like caught in between because he has to be the last person on the bus. He has to make people wait for him. That's just who he is. And, and this guy from the record label laughs. He goes, he goes, Oh, I think you're just, I think you're just being pessimistic. I think this whole deal is going to work, work out great. And then uh, the next day um, he calls me up and he, and he says, uh, well, the deal was all set, but now Harley has Harley and his lawyer wife have a they have they they have a demand of just you, and I'm not even going to go into what it is, but yeah. it was a, a personal demand of me, and if I don't do it, then the deal goes away. So the deal's gone. Sounds about right. And that's what and that's what spawned this whole talk about doing the reunion. Uh, I guess since this whole thing was in the works and everybody was connected, you know, one of these people in the business contacted me and I said, I said, let me just do it this way. I'm, I'm not really interested, but I'm not going to be the one that says no. If you want to spin your wheels and have this whole deal put in, in, in position just to have it go away at the last second because of some r- ridiculous request, that's on you. So. That was that was where it ended last, and uh, and to me that wasn't even close. I feel like your entire career started in like a very organic. We're gonna go go go, and I wonder if you have a perspective that is the one that I share in my head when I talk to people about why they went wrong with Chromax. I don't know if it was Chris Williamson or someone got involved and kind of sparked people in the Chromax band to think of themselves like like you said, like there's like a negotiating and like a more of a, I'm a more important person than the band. So I deserve more. And I don't know where that came from. And I wonder if you had a perspective because I know the things that we read, Chris Williamson is blamed for being a bad guy for this. He did this, but then I've also heard, Hey, he's somebody who took hardcore out of New York city and tried to make it into a bigger metal platform and got like, some of the bands working with bigger professional people outside of New York city, which is kind of all insulated. Um, I heard he was the person responsible for bringing like leeway out to Normandy sound, which is where, you know, some more metallic stuff had been played. And I just like your perspective on what do you think changed? Maybe just you and Harley at first, but what changed the dynamic in the band from being like, we're out here doing this to I deserve more, or I want my special treatment. It's a great question. Um, it certainly wasn't Chris's fault. Chris is what you said in the second half. You know, he was this guy who, uh, you know, was flying by the seat of his pants and took us out of a, a small box and put us on big stages. And, uh, you know, he, it was a total fake it till you make it type thing. He initiated the record deal with Profile Records and uh, and uh, he just did the best he could. He just it just didn't work out. And it, a lot of a big part of why it didn't work out is because we didn't cooperate with him. You know, um, everybody, you know, John and, and Harley were convinced they were being ripped off. You know, anybody who knows, you know, how much it costs for gas and hotels and, and rehearsal and all the things that it takes to get a band going. You know, all you have to do is do the math and you, you realize we weren't being ripped off. Um, but the, the real answer to that question was the you know, it was a combination of things and it was a build, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's, there's fetishistic behavior, you know, there, there's uh, attributes in people's personalities that don't come out until they are uh, exercised. Um, There are, you know, like they say, you know, somebody has the, the, the gene to be a serial killer, but if they're not sexually abused as a child, they won't end up killing anybody. And, um, that kind of thing is, is what happened here. I mean, in the, the, but the, the beginning of that was, was when John came into the band because up until that point, you know, we were just a band. We were a band that was trying to make great music. And then John came in, you know, like people, you know, people are always saying to me like, Oh, you know, how did you always feel about the Harry Krishna thing? And, you know, like as if it was an element of the band 
that was agreed upon at the beginning. <laughs> it certainly wasn't. It was nothing like no way. It was, if anything, it was a trick that, uh, uh, that was played on me. Cause you know, I didn't know that that was going to be a part of it. When, when we got John into the band to me, he was just like a kind of a cool tattooed tough guy who would be great standing in front of the band. I didn't realize that he was going to undermine all the things that were good about the band, which was, you know, the key thing that was good about the band was the musical relationship between Harley and myself. And, you know, John used this Harry Christian thing as, as a, as a, as a way of controlling people. And, and, uh, it was, it was a racket, you know, and, uh, he enlisted Harley and slowly, and it wasn't something and, and, and John didn't voice, you know, any demands or anything about the Harry Krishna stuff at first. It wasn't until he enlisted Harley and had him on his side that all of a sudden the stuff started popping up, like him handing out pamphlets and, and shows and talking about it on stage and things of that nature. Um, but by this point, he had gotten Harley completely completely enlisted, you know, Harley was, you know, he was fodder for this kind of thing, you know, someone without a family, uh, you know, a joiner, you know, Harley jumped in, you know, like, I'll be a punk rocker, I'll be a skinhead, I'll be a Harry Krishna. Now he's like, you know, you know, a jujitsu guy, you know, he loves to, he loves to join these things that are like family, you know, the family that he never had. And so John was able to definitely enlist him. And then when when uh, I guess he was presenting some kind of thing to Harley that it was like he and he, what he and Harley were doing with the Harry Christian movement was important. And that uh, if Paris isn't down with the program, you know, he's the problem. And so when John would try to uh, um, uh, insert this Harry Christian stuff, and if there was any opposition from me, Harley would defend John. And it became this thing where like John would imp impose this stuff and then he knew that he had Harley uh, having his back. And then it became this two against one thing. And, you know, part of the Harry Krishna philosophy, there's all, there's all kinds of aspects to it, which, which they use, th these techniques that they use to disconnect people from their past, like teaching them philosophies, like there's really no true friendship and love and all that kind of stuff. Friendship is just how, what you can get from somebody. And I, Harley started regurgitating this stuff back at me like we're not really friends you know we just had this need for each other you know i learned that in the temple and all this kind of stuff and i was like i don't even know how to argue i don't even know how to respond to this kind of thing because i couldn't appeal to him on the level as a friend and uh and slowly but surely you know like john had gotten the wedge in he got the thin end in and next thing you know it was like you know by the time we put uh we're recording the album you know, John wanted to chant Harry Krishna on the record, like Harry Krishna, 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 Harry, Harry, like on the, and I was like, there's no fucking way that's happening on my record. And of course it didn't happen, but it, it became more ever present. And by the time we, uh, we uh, put out Age of Coral and started touring, it was just like John had Harley under his spell. You know, it was, he was like the puppet master and it was just a bizarre thing to watch, you know, and that was the that was the, the the wedge that destroyed the band. Now, of course, there were there was uh, things that happened uh, again later. You know, even when the Geffen deal was happening, the A and R guy at Geffen was like flattering Harley. Yo, oh, you're the guy. You know, like you you don't need them. You know, like that kind of thing. There's always there's always people in the business that are always coming and whispering into everybody's ears, and then people split off into camps. And, you know. I guess that's what I was. I guess you just got exactly what I was getting to. The camp started that early, huh? Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, it, John and Har John enlisted Harley into this into this thing that he that he was uh, pushing, and uh, and then convinced Harley that they were missionaries of some kind of import, and uh, you know, it became like this battle between me and them, and then. You know, even they even got Doug in the band, you know, to be another vote. You know what I mean? So it became like three against one. But, it, you know, it still didn't change anything because I guess my vote was 50 percent and their three votes was 50 percent because it was always just like this opposition. Whoever was playing drums was just sitting there playing drums. But, um, you know, like they brought, you know, we brought Doug in the band, you know, as a second guitarist. You know, you, you think 
you bring somebody like that into the fold because they're, you know, this powerful musical force. And he was, yeah. you know, he was the guy who created Kraut. He was the, yeah. the, he was the master cylinder of Kraut, you know, having him in the band, we just thought would have uh, made the music so much, you know, more, but, you know, you know how in the military, you know, they, they strip your personality away and uh, they rebuild you. I don't, I, yeah. I, I'm not, I've never been in the military. I'm not pretending I, I was, but apparently that's the method they use. It's, it's a uh, conditioning method to re reprogram people. I feel like that's exactly what happened to Doug. He came into the band and John and Harley just immediately like descended upon him and, and dominated him and uh, just began dressing him. And then, you know, the next thing you know, he was a Harry Krishna, you know, and, uh, and, and they had, they had completely enlisted him and, uh, but he never became that um, that found of music. You know, he he didn't, you know, the only song he contributed to was Crush the Demoniac. And that was it. That was from that point on, he was not creative at all. He just was this kind of reinvented Doug Holland. He wasn't the dynamic Doug Holland from Crowd. He was just kind of like this guy that followed John and Harley around, you know, with a bead bag and a green. No, interesting thing, because at that time, Chromax had a lot of fire under you, and Kraut was a band from that first generation. Um, Siv, uh, Anthony Civarelli would push them pretty good with the, they did a Kraut cover. They would later play in the, um, like the mid-2010s. Uh, they played a Black and Blue Bowl. And I was hoping that more people would eventually pick up how cool Kraut was. And that yeah. was a lot from what you said, a lot from Doug. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you answered the question I would have asked, which is how much was Doug's impact on the music because of what Kraut was. So when you rolled into the next record, you we talked about this previously, the, the sophomore LP is always harder. You were almost doing the – because if they were so invested with Harry Krishna, how where was their focus when it came to writing this record? Well, uh, John – so we went on tour to we were uh, promoting age of quarrel and you know it, oddly enough you know harley is very much you know one of these guys that has whatever he does he's got to be better at it than everybody else when he was a junkie he's like i've done more heroin than, John, than jim morrison you know he, he always has to outdo everybody so the inevitable thing with the harry krishna thing was that Harley had to out Harry Krishna, John. And it was funny because initially, you know, John in interviews, John would be doing his, you know, talking, parroting the same shit over and over and over and over and again. And I guess Harley picked up on that and he started interrupting John and, and, but, but not in just inserting, you know, the, the, the parroted, the, the script, he was inserting his own take on it. And, uh, you know, and, and John was being shut down and they were, they started competing for who could be most Harry Krishna. So there was a, there was a divide between them that started to happen, which, you know, I loved and encouraged. There was really no way to, for me to encourage it, but uh, I just definitely enjoyed watching it. And, uh, and of course, Harley is much more creative and intelligent than John. And he was able to improvise you know, whereas John only worked from the script and Harley made it his own thing. And that was driving John up the wall. So they became very hostile towards each other. And uh, when when we when we were touring the last time we did in Europe um, and, and there was this whole thing where where uh, Doug and uh, Harley were accused of stealing the tour money. Uh, I won't go into the details of that. It doesn't matter anymore. But um Carly went off into Europe with, with money and disappeared and, and John wasn't included in the heist. <laughs> I guess they weren't bonded anymore. And, uh, and John went berserk on Doug, you know, like almost got arrested on the plane, you know, he was threatening Doug to kill him and all this other stuff because of the money. And so when we got back to New York, eventually Harley came back, we started uh, me, me and Petey and Doug just started working on music right away. I think Harley got into a car with some girl and drove cross country and was gone for like, I don't even remember how long, but me, Petey and Doug were rehearsing and working on material that I was writing 
for a while before Harley came back, like, you know, down, but not out and, you know, beginning beginnings of uh, the only one. And uh, when Harley came back and he got involved with, with uh, playing with us again, I, you know, I immediate, you know, I, I had the whole incident on the airplane with John trying to kill Doug. And also when we were on tour, you know, we had a tour manager who was bullied by John night after night. Like we were all supposed to get a certain amount of money per diem. And John would pull the, the tour manager aside and be like, you give me more money. And he was basically extorting money out of our tour manager every night. And this tour manager was getting, you know, really frazzled and felt afraid even to the point where like two, like the last two gigs before the tour, he locked himself in his hotel room and he wouldn't come out. And he started calling the, the last two shows. He called the last two promoters and canceled our last two shows without telling anybody, you know, because he was afraid of John. He just wanted to get away. So between that and, you know, John pouring out all of our beer, <laughs> you know, John would show up into the dressing rooms. As, he, as soon as we pull up in a bus, he would run into the dressing room and grab the beer, whatever beer they put out for the band. And he would pour out half of it because he said half the beer is mine and Harley's and, and Doug. So this is what I'm doing with it. You know, just being a dickhead. So between that, him threatening Doug and, and we were writing this new music and, you know, the few times John came in and tried to sing it, he just, you know, he just, he, his, his learning musical learning curve wasn't, uh, was it he did he wasn't keeping up with me, mine and Harley's, so I just didn't want another record with a singer that what you know wasn't delivering the goods. So as soon as Harley came back, I started pushing towards kicking John out of the band, and uh, and then I I got the incredible gift of John calling me out of the blue because John would also another thing John would do is I quit I quit the band. He quit the band right before we went on tour with Age of Quarrel. You know, he quit the, you know, he, he would just, he was one of those like power play things. He would just quit and then come back, you know, like two weeks later. But he he had quit when we got back from Europe, you know, after the robbery of the of the money. And uh, so he calls me up after, after a, a while of me and Harley and Doug and Petey jamming for a while. And uh, he's like, what's going on? Have you guys been jamming? I said, yes, we have. He goes, so what's going on? You know, why hasn't anybody called me? I said, well, we've decided to move on without you. And there was just silence at the end of the phone. And he said, so it's like that? And I said, yeah, man, it's like that. And that was it. You know, it wasn't any fireworks, no threatening, no, you know, no anger even, or at least none that I heard on the phone. And I saw John on the street subsequently for, you know, years. And we had a decent relationship after that, oddly enough. Um, and that was it, you know. So when, so in, in that's the long answer, you know, because you asked how we- No, we I'd like to hear it. We approached making that record very differently. You know, even though John was gone, Harley was immersed in, you know, this like, you know, he had made it clear that he was not in the band for the music or for us. It was because he had this higher calling to spread this Harry Krishna thing. He was a missionary. I remember reading shit like that. I remember reading old interviews and him kind of going from being this, like what he now spouses more now, which is like this in undefeatable skinhead at 17 years old. who could kill everybody in loss and the LES to be in this like, Traveling prophet of Harry Krishna, and I never understood until you alliterated how that came to be. Well, so. I mean, you know, you know, I, I've known Harley since I was an early te early teenager, and I, I've never seen Harley in a fight. I don't know what to say to that, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. I mean, never, not not once. The only the only time I ever did see him in something close to a fight was when we were on the Revenge tour interesting things about Chromex, especially with you in the band at the time because it's it's you and harley just trying to be in a band and shit is still somehow following you guys i think um there was a moment in um hellfest where harley had said some shit and got surrounded i remember we were it was like a big concert outside and um in syracuse and he had gotten himself surrounded after saying some stupid shit and i feel like 
I, I'm not too much of a new new wave kind of person or new new age person, but I feel like if you're constantly exuding like I could take on all comers and pushing your chest out, people are gonna challenge. And I feel like Harley from time to time chat got challenged because of his nature. And it's always been a thing that I've wondered how much how much of the lure from the what you were talking about that when New York City didn't have the lights and when things were truly lawless were carried into these decades where that just wasn't the case as like a character of the person that he was and kind of overshadowed the stuff that made Cro-Mags really great. I mean, when someone listens to a band, they don't immediately, you know, now with the internet they do, but you, you get attached to the music and you get attached to the sound. And that's what really is a lasting impact of the Cro-Mags is the sound. It's the, it's the fucking... You can't call it punk rock directly. You can't call it heavy metal, but it's right. You're just like, what the fuck is this? And that's what makes it a legacy over four decades. But then these personages get involved and overlaid on top of the band for better or worse that add different elements. And when I talk to you, you have like a direct connection with the actual drive of the music, where it came from, the cadence to how you wrote the riffs. And it's such a different perspective than I've seen written because it's always overshadowed with these, you know, the Harry Krishna stories, the street fights, the gang stories of the early times. There's a big swath of the cro history missing because so much of it is in the characters of the cro themselves. A myth. I, it's, it's the myth. The myth is widely believed but false. You know, and you were talking about, you know, where this whole thing, this whole reputation that Harley had, Again, to me, it was it's interesting how a myth can grow from basically nothing except for talk. But, you know, when when Harley developed this, you know, reputation, he was a kid. He was a little kid. So anybody he was fighting with was like 14 years old. You know what I mean? And then it, it's it, it, when when he it, he gained the power of the band, he would just enlist people. You know, his friends would be kids that were way tougher than him because he that was the kind of people he friended befriended because he wanted to have somebody backing him up and he would lead these packs of kids on you know and they would go around beating people up and and it was you know mostly him just like being their 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 leader uh, i don't think I, like i said i never saw him fight somebody one on one and <laughs> And in, in, in a real actual fight, he just led people to, and this is when he was a little kid, you know, leading older kids to, to do, to do violence. It was, it was a very strange thing. He was certainly not concerned with hurting people, you know, but it, it wasn't, and, and, and I know all this stuff because he would always try to enlist me, you know, we would sit in my mom's apartment and write songs all day and have a great time. And I was loving it. And then I'd meet him later on in the night. He'd be like, yeah, man me and a bunch of guys are going to go fuck these people up, you know? And I'm like, why? He was like, you got to come, you got to have my back. And I'm like, but for what, you know, what did they do? You know? And it was always nothing. And he was like, you don't have my back. And I said, I said, man, if you were in trouble, I'd have your back in a second. I'm not going to have your back to go victimize people. You and 15 people go jump somebody. I'm just like, not interested in that. And so, you know, I, I witnessed that kind of thing all the time. It was just mostly, you know, enlisting people and, 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 you know, what they call, uh, you know, uh, des- uh, you know, uh, designating people to do the violence for him, you know, well, not he actually just, doing it himself. Just, and, then, and, and the funny thing is by the time we put out the record and stuff like that, it was really just a pose. I mean, I guess if you can make a crazy face, like he does, you have this reputation and, and he talks all about it. He, like, he always uses expressions like, blooded you know i was blooded i went in my first fight you know like using these very dramatic phrases and stuff like that but i, I do find it interesting that after all these years you know he spent the past 10 years uh, you know studying jujitsu so he could actually be the person he claimed to be his whole life and wasn't um and i don't know what that amounts to i don't know if i, I don't no, um, I can't imagine, you know, the 55 year old Harley Flanagan running around fighting in the streets. I'm sure he just stays home with his wife and rides his pony or whatever he does. Well, that's what I was in touch with something you just said. And it makes total sense. 
you know, those guys were enamored with like a street culture and like the, you always hear in the LES about the squats and all the different younger, like, I mean, like, I believe uh, like the guy from the mad, he had a place like a loft and a squat. Like there's all these, there's all these older ideas that don't exist in the present time. What, what LES was made of where you might have five or six people living in an apartment close to a seven, close to these places where the street culture was, and you said it was a small scene. So you might've had what 90 people total, you know, a- across different bands that are sharing music you like the music aspect of it, but you also had your family there and you had, you were still going to high school. So you weren't attached to the kind of like hanging out for the, for the violence for violence sake and the, and the goonery that took place. So your presentation and like the direction that you took your path was always about your interest. It wasn't, you didn't get enamored to the street. And I, and it's why we can have this conversation. Your perspective is different. How much of the, now obviously, you know, there's tons of books and there's different people who have, you know, literally lived it, but a lot of the people that you grew up, I mean, you know, whether it's Sean Tagger, you know, there's a ton of people that grew into very famous people that started to, I mean, look at the rise of the Beastie Boys, you mentioned hip hop, getting signed to the profile. And I mean, you were there for so much of it. Graffiti culture is my, like a giant art now. It seems like in the burgeoning stage of where all this is blowing up the people that saw it for what it is and like what your father said, it keeps coming back to me. It's like monetize your talent. You know, I think some people got lost in the street shuffle and the whatever the hell was going out there instead of what you guys were focused on. And it's why you're sitting where you're sitting. And some of these guys aren't sitting in the same mentality and space, you know? Agreed. I mean, just being a teenager or a kid in New York city, there is a certain expectation for you and how you behave towards strangers. And, you know, when we were kids, everybody, you know, we get into fights every single day. I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't get into a fight. I, I'd fight at the drop of a hat if I had provocation, but I didn't, this whole idea of like going out in a pack and victimizing people was just bizarre to me. And I think it was even bizarre to the people in the pack, but they were just so interested in impressing Harley and, um, but, uh, you know, I, I've been in a thousand street fights, you know, that was just what was expected. And I'm really, really glad that the rules have changed. You know, New York is a very different city. You know, you don't have people. I mean, when, when I was a teenager, a phrase you heard more often than anything else was like, what the fuck are you looking at? You know, on the subway, if you looked at somebody, they would say, what the fuck are you looking at? You know, it was, it was a confrontational uh, culture. Just, you know, you didn't look at other people. You, you minded your business. You stayed in your neighborhood. And in our neighbor, in the neighborhoods that, that we hung out in, the Lower East Side, you know, it's hard to imagine now Avenue A where A7 was. But at that time, almost all the storefronts on Avenue A were boarded up. There were no businesses there. There was no bus stop on Avenue A. You know, most of the buildings down there, a lot of, not most of them, but a lot of the buildings were abandoned. There were rent strike uh, banners outside the ones where people were living, you know, on Avenue A, the reason a place like A7 could exist is because there was nobody to complain. I mean, it was literally an urban wasteland. And we went down there and we took it over basically because there were no cops on the street. We didn't have beat cops at the time. It was, it was, it wasn't safe for a cop to be on the street by himself. You know, it was just a very different place. So as kids, you know, we weren't thinking about playing baseball and stuff like that. We had baseball bats, but when we weren't playing baseball, it was just, we were hanging out on the streets. And and fortunately for us on the hardcore scene, we had this amazing musical, uh, mutual musical uh, interest. And we, we, we focused all that into the music, but because we were all street kids, you know, that part of the culture became part of it. But, you know, again, we were like young teenagers you know, when we got into, when you're 15 years old, 14 years old, you get into a fight with another 14 years old, 14 year old, it's over when it's over. You know what I mean? And you shake hands and nobody's that badly hurt. You know, even when I was growing up in the Bronx and they were like, you know, I was witness to rumbles. They were rumbles between, you know, 20, you know, 13 year olds. (laughs) When it was over, it was, you know, everybody was lumped up, but uh, it wasn't that terrible. And so, you know, that's basically where we were coming from. 
and as we became young adults when the albums came out and began touring around the world, I guess a lot of that talk continued. And it, it just seems to me really funny that it's perceived that that behavior was part of an adult life and not a kid's life. You know what I mean? Survival of the Streets, you know, all those songs were written by like 15 year olds. No, I, I find that the culture finds anthems in different things. And then there is an ideologies that are born from them. I mean, it's an interesting, uh, one of the things I always thought was great was like Jimmy Gestapo was like considered like a, you know, like a bouncer at a seven, you know, when you think about like, he's a younger guy, you see pictures, but that was like almost like a Lord of the flies moment. Like this is our beach. This is our world. And yet when we, when we see the chaos that would come from the interpersonal problems within Chromax and the inability to get to this commercial success, your art and your videography and your cinematography and the fact that you've found success in doing these videos. I mean, Anyone who was around saw Onyx Slam. I mean, like, I was an avowed metalhead who was kind of bummed out on the idea that all my friends who had long hair were cutting it and started dressed like crisscross. But then Onyx came out, and I was like, all right, this is some shit I can fuck with. Okay, you know, like, I understood real street, hitch, uh, real hip-hop shit. My mom had wrote graffiti in the 1970s. You know, we had break dancers in our neighborhood. But it was like the pop hip-hop I couldn't fuck with. But I seen Slam. I was just like, all right, this is not, this is not goopy shit. This isn't like the the positive hip hop. This isn't the crisscross. This is some other shit. And uh, we had a guest on here, Zach, who wrote uh, some of the stuff that is now like really important with uh, the beat down hardcore. And he said he missed being at the Brooklyn Bridge for a video shoot because of the fact that he had to have an allergy shot. <laughs> and he like it's like one of his greatest like, fuck, I wish I was there. You were able, because of the Chromags, or in part because of the Chromags, but also because of your own interests, to leverage yourself into this burgeoning world of where, like the, where the where you're shooting Anthrax, you're shooting all these uh, videos, and I think that's one of the biggest reasons why you never felt like, from a perspective of the viewerships of the Team Harley, Team JJ, it was like, oh, there's Team Harley, Team JJ. I'm just gonna go over here and make videos and just do my fucking world, and I've got other shit to do. Is that how you see it? Or is this kind of like you just didn't get involved when the Chromags wasn't spinning at full wheels commercially? I mean, when to me, the Chromags was just a vehicle for my songs. And once it wasn't, it that my interest was, I mean, and anything like this whole team, this or team that certainly is not on my radar. I don't follow it. I, I, you know, people know by now not to share that kind of stuff with me, even though they do from time to time. Uh, if it's particularly funny, um, I, I like I like I said, you know, I fired John from the band in 1988, or he let, or he, I let him quit. Uh, that was a long, long time ago. He he's really been off my radar since then, except for from time to time when he made threats against me, he threatened to have my hands broken for ratting him out to the military, which never happened. Um, but of course, that never happened. You know. John was always very vocal about how he's going to fuck Paris up. But during that era, we were working out at the same gym at, on a daily basis. I saw him every day. People would come up to me like, oh, my God, I saw John walking down the street. Be careful. I was like, yeah, he was probably walking to the gym where we go every day. So, you know, a lot of, you know, I hate to say it, but a lot of this is just for show and show business. And, um, you know, at least on their side, I just don't care. Uh, you know, I, I, the only reason I care is is when uh, when John uh, announced that he was going to do a Chromags album. That to me, I thought would be dreadful. You know, he came to me and at, and tried to enlist me to write songs. I wasn't interested, and he tried. Is he, there uh, is there one reason why you weren't interested? Just like as a general, like what 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 stopped you? Just as a general thought, I just it just has no interest. Of, to me, if I'm if I write a song, if I sit and craft a song for you know, you know, we talked about having influences, you know, that could be 20 years ago. It's a song might take you might write it in five minutes, or you might write it in 20 years. But if to it, the investment of writing an entire album of music is huge for an artist, you know, it's everything you have to give. It's like you empty your pockets onto the table for a year or two. You know, it's a humongous 
undertaking an investment and, and, you know, a part of you and to, for me to craft an album, uh, at the level that I feel that I can deliver to have it be, um, subverted by somebody who isn't capable of delivering at the same level as me just doesn't interest me. I think something that I read was that you pay somebody, you pay somebody by the hour, what you think is probable for what the job is, but what you're, when you have a, someone who really has experience, you have to pay more because you're paying for the experience. And, and I've been thinking about this the whole time we're talking, especially with the Van Halen's and the rushes, something that you're going to write, that's going to come out in 2022 or 23 is going to bear the weight of all the years of experience of you honing in these influences of yours. And that's why whatever comes from you, it's not just that you were in the Chromax. It's that you're, you're, you're taking these influences and you're infusing them into your music. And so where someone could, the, the argument had been said like, well, you know, someone could just write a Chromax record for them. Yeah. There's going to be songs that sound like it, but I don't think that the sound that I heard on chaos magic can come from anywhere else because you know, the origin of the influences, those original songs. And that's where it birthed back in, you know, like, and and it's great to hear that you're like, can literally say, this is the part from age of quarrel. This is the rush song I heard unless there's no way of fusing that situation together. You'll have someone that can mimic an age of quarrel song, but unless they know the blueprint for what that age of quarrel song, it's going to fall short. And despite the fact that there's obviously a lot of people in Chromax who would, uh, Chromax fans that would love to hear it unless it comes from that origin place or that place where it touches back in the way chaos magic did for me, it's going to fall short. And so it's not me saying, Hey, you should do it. It's understanding what you just said in that to put an album together. It, it, it's a, it's really a craft that comes beyond just, Oh, I want to write age of quarrel too, or best wishes too. It comes from that deeper understanding of where you got that formula from. Yeah, it's just a continuation. I'm just continuing what I'm doing. And, I, you know, I, I, I always feel bad when I say something about like that about John, um, because John is not without talent. He, what he did on Age of Quarrel is obviously relevant and great. and People love it. It's fantastic. My, my main problem is born from experience. I saw John withdraw once he got outside of his comfort level. You know, initially when he joined the band, he was just singing vocal melodies that were already written by Eric Casanova. And so he came in at a a very high comfort level. And then um, the songs that he contributed uh, were excellent. You know, Malfunction, Seekers of the Truth, We Gotta Know, they're all, they're just as good as any of the, the songs in the album. So he did a great job. But at some point he began to withdraw when he when he when it started to get into areas which were out beyond his grasp as a musician because you know the 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 cadence and the and the and the, the melodic structure of asia coral is very simple it's very much a straight line you know and it was something within his grasp when we, when we started writing best wishes it was he, he wasn't finding those normal um cookie cutter um phrasings working and he was struggling with it and when i tried to help him or guide him he really fought it and it was you know also during the period of time where we were having this harry krishna conflict so he was just like fuck you about everything and uh so i i don't personally think that john is incapable of delivering a good performance i just don't think he knows how to uh beyond the context of, you know, like age of quarrel. And that's why we, that's why I didn't want him on best wishes because I realized that, um, he wasn't, he would, he would never be willing to take direction. And, and he, he could have easily been guided to a good performance by either Harley or myself. You know, when, when you don't understand music, it seems like this vast mathematical impossibility, uh, combined with, you know, inherent talent, you know, that has nothing to do with practicing and training your ear and all that kind of stuff. Cause they don't, because they don't understand it. It seems like it's something that they will never be able to attain. So I guess he just always figured that he, what's the point of listening? I, I, I'm not one of those naturals. 
And I know that's a long explanation, but I, I don't course. want I, I don't want to just qualify John as some some scrub that I you know I wouldn't waste my music on. John is somebody who would not come to the table with the tools required to make a great album now. And it's only because he holds himself back. That's why I wouldn't be interested. And I don't know if he could ever be trained or, or changed or convinced. So, it, you know, I'm not interested in convincing him. I'd rather just find somebody who can sing and can do something or not sing. Or, I, you know, I put, out, I put out a song that is a complete musical thought without a singer. For me, when I think of hardcore, you know, you got to go all the way back to like Kenny Aaron's and, you know, Crazy George Mad, you know, even Ralphie G, you know, all these old the deliveries are very simplified because that was the style of music. And I, I, I relate heavily to what you're talking about. I, I, I'm a straight up goon. I don't, I, I don't even call it singing. When someone in, in my work, because I, I pour concrete, and they're like, oh, you sang in a band? I'm like, it's not singing. I just, I do something so people jump around. And I, and I feel like you sit, you're you you're actually able to speak a hard truth about the way a lot of hardcore singers are. We're not musically, we don't understand the often keys and, you know, scales. It's harder. And so when you go to that next level and you're talking about music and how to write lyrics to it, you do have to be trained if you're used to very formulaic, you know, 4-4, four, four, you know, very quick patterns. And the one thing I'm, I'm happy you said, that, you know, John's impact on Age of Quarrel, like, I don't even understand. I don't understand as a heavy metal listener the first time I heard Age of Quarrel because he was singing differently. It wasn't on beat, it was, but it, it made it work. And I don't know if another person would have did that. The things that John has done recently musically, I think because he has guys like the Blood Clock guys who are able to keep the formula in those patterns, he's able to shine. But if you're going to expand beyond that, I don't know if it's something that is even in his wheelhouse to want to try because imagine being, if you're 40 years of being, if someone like a John Joseph, the fan base, like the team, the team, the team JJ is going to want to hear, they want to hear him be like age of quarrel. But if you're a little bit beyond age of quarrel, he's not going to match to that. And I can relate to that. I find the hardest thing for me as a Chrome Ags fan is when Harley began singing solely because he has this like, I don't even know what you would call it, the way his patterns work. And he over embellishes, but I heard he, he did a, He did a track on Stigmata. He did a guest vocal on Stigmata a track in the 90s. And it was the one time I heard Harley sing his shit. And I'm like, that was actually pretty badass. But you're, it's, it's hard to listen to a song now hearing Harley sing it his way when you're so ingrained in hearing it John's way. And so it's, it's also got to be interesting for you as a player now. You had said left hand and right hand on the bass. If you listen to Craig Satari and other podcasts, he talks heavily about a bass player's role in the left hand having to do one way and right hand. So it was interesting you brought that up. I don't, and, I, and I've spoke to AJ, but I don't know if, because AJ was, when you guys were playing, AJ was at the beginning in a band called The Unruled. I don't know if he would be interested in even trying to write something that would have been mimicking AJ Quarrel, because AJ's AJ his own musical entity you know he's done his own path he's written many records that hardcore people love so it really comes down to the big point i'm trying to make here i don't think another age of quarrel like record could come from anybody else besides paris mayhew because you have the blueprint you know i think all the elements would have to exist i don't think a harley singing on an age of quarrel 2 would have the same presence but i don't you know it's that's what makes that one record specifically so important to hardcore it's like like you and you said the line lightning in a bottle you know, like that was the one time you get everybody on one page to make the fucking record. But I still love that you're now in this new modality of trying to go back to creating. Because the Revenge record, the, um, you, the, I know you you probably dealt with this in a lot on that tour. In Philadelphia, we were at that show. We had our own gang issues with skinheads, like an actual Nazi skinheads. Oh. And um, the fight was actually during all at war before Pro Mags even got on stage. And it got so out of control, the lights came on. And I remember the balance was kind of going like everybody in that fight got out. So half of us got kicked out before Crow Mags even got to play on that tour from mm -hmm. the fight just from all at war. So I don't even know if you've ever played in the modern sense of hardcore where the stage clearing brawls, the need for baseball bats when you play, where the whole shit can fall apart. 
we're in a completely different age now where a single punch gets put on the video on the internet and everyone's argues there's not the same level of chaos. So I'm kind of excited to see what will happen to see a civilized hardcore world see a Paris Mayhew out here playing riffs. I can't wait. You know, I really hope I, I said earlier, you know, I hope we're not deluding ourselves and think things that are going to go back to normal because it has been a year and there's really no indication that things are even getting close to normal. People talk about a vaccine, but, you know, there's been no results. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if we're if we if we had another conversation like this a year from now and nothing has changed. Um, you know, I, I, I spoke to somebody recently who works, you know, with somebody at the CDC and they were saying something like um, the problem with this virus is it's not acting like a normal virus. You know, usually viruses come out, they they have a lifespan and then they, they begin to fade and die and uh, disappear. You know, they, they have this va- this vast effect. Everybody b- builds up their immunity and then it just kind of like, you know, has its course. And once it runs its course, it's over. He said, but this virus isn't behaving like that. It's reinventing itself. It's learning and it's acting like it's mechanized, like, a, you know, like it's been manufactured to overcome things. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not making any implication of of. of of a conspiracy theory or anything. I'm just saying, I'm just acknowledging the fact that here we are a year later and nothing's really changing. And uh, I guess I had bad timing when I put out my song, you know, part of the reason Actually, I, I think the opposite, I think you had great timing because some like when we talked about previously, I'm going to touch back on this. You had said the record cycle, something that changed was uh Tuesday became the Friday. So every Friday, a record would come out now, right before the pandemic had really gotten, out of control there might have been two records sometimes three records in a hardcore cycle come out on every friday so you were vying at that time to stay up with whatever young band or whatever new band or whatever metal and i actually felt like there were great records that were getting swept under the rug because everybody kind of formalized that we have to release it on this day and you can't just go ahead and put a record out you can't put a song out so if your record was your record staggered away from that so it, it, it got it got more fuel because there were, the record labels also almost a lot of them said, you know what, we're going to shelf this release till we get our tour, like you were talking about as well. So there is a silver lining that Chaos Magic without, like, you know, it's a six minute instrumental. This is what people are like, holy fuck. And I think that you see I've seen records that have gotten a little bit extra sunlight because the next record hasn't come right after it. And the next record hasn't come right after it. And, oh, I didn't see them on tour, so I forgot about them because this next thing came out. There is a silver lining in that you were able to expose the world to this while we were kind of in this captive thing. Well, that's, I mean, that's great to hear. I, I'm, I'm glad that that's the case. I, I just meant mostly in terms of being able to follow it up with live performances. You know, the, the, the inevitable question is, you know, who's in the band, who's going to be in the band? And at the moment, there's really no reason to enlist anybody. I will, you know... I, I used the model when we did revenge of hiring a drummer and a guitar player. And that really, that really worked for that. You know, when I had a partnership with somebody else, but here I find myself, you know, by myself writing and performing everything exactly the way I want it. So I'd, I'd like to uh, release it, you know, the, the first batch of songs like that, you know, to be my singular musical voice. And then I'll enlist the band, you know, whatever, whoever the band is going to be when I perform live, they're going to be awesome because I'm definitely not going to skimp. I'll go out as a three piece if I can only find three great people. You know what I mean? If I could find, you know, who knows what it'll be, but it'll be good. I mean, in terms of quality, quality players. You touched on the video release and instead of going with the LP, going with the EP. And that's a, that's a model that hip hop has used recently is like a mix. Like here's our song. We're dropping it. And in fact, um, Jamie from code orange was on the show. Code orange has done similar things. And they've done something that you've done where their presentation in a new song is video first. Mm. And it's, you know, obviously they're, they have a lot of interesting elements that are not unlike the stuff that was coming out of the early nineties. You get very industrial Mecca, you know, it's a very sci-fi looking look to their band and their sound. But I find that the same kind of marketing that you use with chaos magic can be employed to keep people interesting in that you drop this video 
your look and that presentation, it, it, it does keep it. I mean, and, and I mean, you guys got tens of thousands of plays now on that on YouTube. So if it was, if it was a matter of, Oh, well, who's in the band, if it was a matter of lyrics or vocals. It wouldn't have got this much fanfare, but there's something in it. You know, there's something in that song and the presentation. So I do think that you do have the ability with what's going on to continue to release things, whether it's six months from now. And um, I, I were involved with the national internet uh, independent video uh, venue association. I can't ever say that fucking word, right? Neva. <laughs> and the earliest I've heard is that like when the pandemic happened, everything got scrapped with the maybe July, then it was maybe September. Then it was like, we're shutting down for the year. We're going to write the whole year off as losses. No one's going to do anything. I've now been contacted recently about the potential for bands that I work with to start booking as early as late September, early October. But like uh, something you would touch on about the way that the, the disease is, um, there was a guest last year on Joe Rogan's podcast, for better or worse, this person is an actual epidemiology who's been to that lab. He studied these things and he said that they have already looked at it and it does look like it's something that was worked on. And that this isn't the natural iteration. This is like the third or fourth variation. And that's why it's able to be so strong is because it's been worked on by humans. And that that is why it's not naturally being taken out. And I, I have the same viewpoint as you. I used to be sunny day. It's next, you know, in a couple months, we'll be back. I, I don't yeah. think there's a, I think just like post world, post America and 9 11 situation, we're going to be post post COVID. America. And I don't think, I think it's going to take another full operating year. I think sometime in the spring of next year is when you'll see semblances of people either being at the point of, I don't have another choice and I'm opening, or you're going to see people say, this is what it is. We have to deal with it. But I think that you're going to see another year before you're going to see big venues being open. You're going to see limited capacity, but the big, big venues open, I don't even think are a priority at this moment because we're talking you know the deal. They're talking ten to twenty thousand is what they're looking at. But right. the hardcore scene, I could see using going. We're gonna. I could see a lot of hardcore promoters having to go to small venues and halls. But that's where we thrive, and that's actually where artists like you make more money. Because if you're dealing with someone like me, you know, I don't have the same overhead. I don't have the same. St- you know, the the expenses are way lower. So there there could be a chance for an in a. a boost in the small show becoming back to what uh, hardcore bands who are able to play much larger rooms see because they see, oh yeah, they're not taking all this extra. Oh, they don't have a $4,000 security budget, you know, and, and the mm-hmm. artist will, an artist will return to getting more of the money in their pocket, you know, and I, that's mm-hmm. what I hope for as a DIY promoter. Hey man, fingers crossed. I, 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 I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a naysayer. Nobody wants to return to playing shows or seeing shows. I just want to see shows. Uh, more than I do. So I, I wish, I, w- I hope everything that you're doing to make it happen moves forward. I would like to ask you a couple quick ones and we'll get you out of here. We've been talking a long time and I really appreciate your time here. And I know you got a wife to hang out with, so I, I don't want to hold you too much longer. What is your no, most- I mean, I got, I mean, I got to say that I, I'm enjoying this conversation because it's not, it doesn't seem like a stock questions and uh, and it's good to have somebody have the look of recognition of understanding what I'm talking about and being so immersed in, in what we both love. It's, it's a different kind of interview, I, I guess, maybe because I've just been doing mostly regular music podcasts. And I don't even know if these people know who I, I, who I am when I'm talking to them. Yeah. I seen you do a pizza one the other day. I, I, I like, I, I don't like to over immerse myself in who I'm speaking with, but I wanted to get an idea. Maybe I'm retarded. I just want to get an idea of your cadence the kind of flow and what you speak on, but I don't, I don't watch the whole thing. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to go, oh, I don't want to ask him that. Someone asked him, but I wanted to get an idea of how you, and I, and you did, you've done a lot recently, but this is something for me that there's, I obviously love Chromax and I love hardcore in nature when a new book comes out and I, you're a person that doesn't get enough uh, airplay in the social construct. Cause it's like, oh, it's not Harley. It's not John, but, you're the creator of this sound and this record is vastly important to the culture. And I know that you're driven by a lot more than just talking bad about people, but also your interest. I mean, the fact that you have a fine art degree 
shocked me when I looked that up. And then I was thinking like, does he do his painting? And then that's when you explain, you know, hey, I, I did a switch. You know, like there's a lot to you that goes beyond being a Cromag, you know, and that's that comes out in the conversation. So I appreciate you uh, seeing. I don't do a question. I don't write a list of question people. I, you know, I have ideas where I want to go, thoughts that we should talk about. And this is the first one I want to talk about. You obviously love rock and roll from that period. I feel like when the clock struck like 1999 into 2000, that creativity pool just kind of we- like welled up, like it like dried up. But if you listen to stuff from the 60s, 70s, into the 80s, it's almost like we built this store of creativity. And the last two decades, we've been running dry on bad regurgitation of ideas in every form, be it movie, music, TV shows. It's an interesting observation. It's an interesting observation that there was like this well, and maybe the well is empty. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, because the the ideas that you took from were birthed in the early '70s that kind of rolled into what would be the 1980s. And obviously, in the 1980s, because of that, first some of the '90s stuff and 2000s onward is it just feels like cotton candy junk food. I, I I know that you worked on TV shows. That's more of something that you do. For money, you don't go. Oh, this art doesn't affect me. I just hold the camera, but then you also do art for your own. Is that how you balance the lack of ingenuity and, and art in what's going on in the current pop culture world? That's that's that's, that's a good, difficult question. You know, yeah, you, you, you have to be an artist to work as a camera operator. You know, because it's constant improvisation. I mean, there's, there's certainly a format to follow, but especially as a steady cam operator, because you're walking with the camera and it's a constant re composition and, and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a flow, you, you, you certainly have to be an art artist first, but you're really a technician and you're there to deliver. And sometimes you have to deliver in one take because the actors don't want to do it more than once or, or we're on a schedule and we have to make the day. You know, that's, that's why I um, used that quote earlier, that inspiration is for amateurs. You know, it'd be nice to just sit around and play your guitar until you're inspired. But I remember, you know, when we were making Revenge, having, you know, being like, this song needs a bridge and an ending and I need it right now. And I would sit down and write it, you know, and, I, I definitely uh, learned that from the film business. You know, you, you, you can't wait for inspiration. You show up to set, you show up on time, you do it exactly the way you need to do it, and then you get your check. And we work at very high levels uh, in the film business. It's uh, the, the best of the best doing, working as a team. And it, it's a fantastic thing. That's, and I do it because I enjoy it. Uh, I, I do it because I get paid a lot of money, um, but it's nothing compared to like making chaos magic, which is pure passion. You know, I spent, I worked harder on that video than probably I have on anything in my life. I mean, I was editing it for five months, five months, you know, like I edited Onyx Slam for five days. Wow. And I spent 20 days, 22 days shooting it. I, I spent two days shooting Onyx Slam. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I hope that that there isn't a well uh, that has been that has been played out uh, for creativity. Maybe maybe I have the benefit of, of an established style. So when I when I when I when I just continue doing what I'm doing, uh, it works. Um, I think you know your point to the power of the chromag sound or the thing that makes it relevant that you can't just hire someone to do it is, you know, we left the group, we left the blueprint behind in 1987 and no one's been able to read it. You know, I don't hear, I never heard another band that really sounded exactly like the Chrome eggs. I've, I've heard influence, you know, mostly from best wishes, but certainly not from that, you know, right hand picking style I have that you commented on from the playthrough. I mean, I went out of my way to show my right hand, in those close-ups yeah, you did. because to me, it's like, that is such an inherent part of my style. It's physical. It's part of my, you know, it's part of my, my body. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as a result, it's part of the way I write. And I, I, I guess I have that benefit that uh, it's already an established style. Uh, it, yeah. One of the 
things that I, I found very gratifying from releasing the song, besides the fact that I got all this positivity and I get to talk to folks like you about my music instead of going to working on a TV show is, uh, you know, my, my contemporaries or people who used to be my contemporaries, because it's really in the music business, you're very much either on the inside or you're on the outside. And when you're on the inside, everybody's friends, you know, you know, I knew all the other bands and you run into them on tour and backstage at festivals and, and you don't really know each other, but everybody's like the best friends because everybody's familiar because they know your records, you know, their records and you feel like, you know, each other, but once you, once you stop doing it, you're really on the outside. And I've lost, lost touch with almost everybody. And one of the only people that I stay in contact with is Phil Anselmo. And, uh, when he heard chaos magic, he, uh, he, he's not, you know, in person, he talks a lot, but when he emails, <laughs> it's very short. And he just wrote, uh, just listen to the video, just watch the video. He goes, I really thought all hardcore had been done already. He goes, but I was wrong. He said, good job. And I, and I thought to myself, I appreciate that because I didn't really try to do something different, but I feel like I took whatever I had been done doing in the past and brought it to um, my, uh, you know, to that, to that top point on my learning curve. I did, I made it the best I could. And I think it's the best thing I've ever done. No, it, it's, it, and the fact that you brought Phil up is actually excellent because that's another person that has been through the ups and downs, but as famous as he's gotten with his music, he really knows a lot about hardcore punk. I mean, he did Poison Idea covers. So if he's giving you that, that's a, that's definitely something to put in your cap just because he actually knows the music and he knows the history. Do you feel the same way now? Or I should say, do you feel now looking back that so much of what people see in the Cro-Mags is, is just rumor and gossip and that it, a lot of it was your uh, the ego and frustration that the band didn't get bigger manifested in bad behavior? Or do you feel specifically like at some point because of the things like not getting on the Kevin that Fomags would have burnt out commercially anyway? Well, I'm very gratified in that in when we were leading up to Age of Quarrel and this whole Harry Krishna thing was ramping up between John and Harley, that I did not allow it to color the record. You know, the record is really not that much different than it would have been pre-John. You know, there's no, you know, there wasn't any Krishna artwork and there was no lyrical content. It was still like, don't tread on me and I'll kick you when you're taking a fall and show you no mercy. And it was still a great heavy album. It was musically exactly what I wanted it to be. I worked harder on it uh, than anything else I had ever done in my life and brought it to that point. And ultimately, all the battling I did, maybe even the, the splintering of the band because of the, the fighting for that position uh, may have led to things not working out in the end. But in the end, a, a band really is what they leave behind. You know, forever Black Sabbath is going to be, you know, Ozzy Osbourne can wear diapers on stage and, you know, stumble out on stage and all that kind of, and be on a TV show and say funny things and be a goofy guy. But for the rest of our lives, Black Sabbath is untarnished and untouched. And they are, you know, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, and Volume 4. And, uh, and the Cro-Mags, in the end, despite all the you know, loud talk and tough guy, this, and, you know, rumors and urban legend. Age of Quarrel is pristine. It, it, it is uh, untouchable, untouched by all the claims, all the religious cockamamie horseshit and, uh, and, uh, and our personal, uh, um, you know, going our own way, you know, it's, that is left behind. That is the cro -Mags. And, you know, 20 years from now, it'll still be Age of Quarrel, Best Wishes and Revenge. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm okay with that. No, that's, 
that's actually a great way to look at it. Now that you said that I was going to leave off there, but I want to ask one question now because it just came to mind. You were involved, obviously, enough to have like good communications with other bands. Was there ever a moment where someone was like, hey, why don't you join my band? Why don't you just become a like a like how you said to stay in the game, to stay on the tour? What drove you instead to just operate a camera and do your own thing versus just jump in as just someone in a band that's professional and stay in a tour life? What was the deciding factor between tour life and camera work and film work? What was the was there a tipping point or you already kind of knew if I'm not creating my own shit, I'm not going to do this? I mean, the bottom line is I'm not interested in playing other people's music. I'm only interested in making my own music. That's, I've, you know, Age of Quarrel is my music. You know, that's, and that's why I did it. When, you know, when I left the band um, was right before Alpha Omega was recorded. And uh, myself and this guy, Rob Buckley, had just spent like basically uh, the better part of a year writing that entire album by ourselves. You know, Harley didn't participate at all. He was like selling pot in Central Park, couldn't be bothered. And whenever I told him, you know, like, hey, come down to jam. We have all these songs. He would say things like, don't get don't get attached to too much of that music because I've already written an entire album with the music. that's going to change the genre. And I was like, oh, OK, well, you know, why don't you come down and show us some of these songs? Of course, none of these songs ever came to light because they didn't exist. He was just trying to belittle. You know, that's one of his things. He's always tries to qualify everybody around him you know he's just you know it's a character flaw but uh he was always trying to like be like oh you know all that music with your writing it's not even you know don't even don't, don't get your hopes up it's even going to be on the album I'm like whatever so me and rob sat down we wrote literally that entire album and uh you know and i guess harley became jealous <laughs> of my relationship with rob who I, because I was writing with him and and uh, we had become friends and we were hanging out all the time and uh, and he just became such a pest and he just started being lousy towards Rob and we did a little two week tour me him Dave Desenzo like a warm up to try to try out the new material on the road and uh, and then he at the last minute was refusing to play a bunch of songs we got to play Age of Coral songs I said the point of this tour is not to play our Age of Coral song it's to test out the new material. And he was just such a jerk on the tour. I mean, when we left the last gig from D.C. to drive to New York, everybody in the band, the T-shirt guy, our roadies and Harley's girlfriend all rode back to New York in the T-shirt van. Because nobody wanted to be on the nobody wanted to be on the tour bus with him. And uh, Harley was also saying, you know, when we put out this album, the album credits, they can't say that Rob wrote all the, like, wrote, you know, co-wrote all these songs because the fans won't like it. It's got to say something like all songs by the Cro-Mags. You know, he didn't want, you know, he wanted people to assume that he wrote the songs. <laughs> but, uh, and that became like a real sticking point with me and Rob, uh, you know, because we had spent all this time working on these songs. And then once he, once Harley finally came into the fold, of course, this album that he claimed to have written didn't exist. And we just, we just, we only worked on the songs that me and Rob had written. And then me, Harley and Rob uh, went into a little studio in West Beth and we, and we demoed all those songs. And then, you know, then we did that little tour and it was just intolerable. His behavior was just intolerable. So we quit and uh, we planned to, you know, just move, go on with our songs and start a new band. And uh, you know, we didn't think it was a race to record those songs because who would record somebody else's songs? Like we never in our wildest dreams imagined that Harley would go and record our songs, but he did. He went and he recorded the Alpha Omega album. So he basically stripped us of like a year's worth of work. You know, as a musician, as a songwriter, you're all you, you're only the sum of all the songs you've written up to that point. And he had basically just taken it all away and left us empty. So I would have had to, yeah, I couldn't just pick up where I left off. I'm not the kind of guy who joins a band. I would have had to like sat down and started that process of writing an album all over again, spending the next two years, getting myself in a position where I could get a record deal and make a record again. And I just wasn't, I just, I felt empty. I felt musically empty. 
I wasn't inspired. I didn't have a bunch of stuff that I was, pr- all those songs that me and Rob were so proud of. Were taken. It, it had just been stolen and put out on a record. And the record says exactly like Harley said it would say, all songs written by the Cro-Mags. Actually it says all songs written by Harley Flanagan and the Cro-Mags, which is not a lie, but it's not the truth either. It was just him deceiving the fans. So that, you know, that's really the long answer to why I didn't just jump into another band is because I was empty. I had nothing to play, but I'm also, I follow opportunities. I follow opportunities. I'm sorry. We keep stepping on each other. I just want to cap that part up. I I follow opportunities and I had the opportunity to go into, to go back into the film business and it's a creative life and it's a life I like and I'm satisfied by. So I just fell into that and I put my guitars in storage and I never went I never pursued that process of building up those songs. And I literally, my red guitar, my bitch was in storage for nine years. And, and a friend of mine. for revenge, right? Yeah. And a, no, no, this was, uh, uh, yes. And I came back for revenge. Uh, but, you know, I had a bass and I was playing that bass. And that's when I wrote like all those, all the songs from revenge. I mean, by the time me and Harley got back together, I had most of that music written. And I wrote 90% of Revenge, you know, and, and, and I, when I, when I was in the studio recording with Dave DiCenzo, we were doing basic tracks and there were a couple of songs that Harley didn't even know how to play. Cause he was doing that same thing he does. It's like, I don't like those songs that you wrote. I'm not even gonna learn how to play them, you know, to make you feel bad about your music, but we had to make a record. So me and Dave did the basic tracks alone. And I remember listening back to the song called tore up which to me at that point was like my chaos magic at the time. It was like the, you know, the best I could do. It was like this big puzzle, very intricate guitar playing. You know, I was really proud of it. And we were in the the control room, me and Dave listening to it back when we finally got a perfect, very difficult song to play. And it was at that moment where I was like, oh shit, I could have done this by myself. You know, me and I wrote the song all by myself. Me and Dave just recorded it by myself and two other songs. And uh, and I remember at that moment thinking, oh, well, you know, we're here. Maybe the next album I'll do by myself. But that that moment was an epiphany for me. It, it, if anything, it facilitated me making the music that I'm making today, because for the first time in my life, I wasn't attributing somebody playing my music back at me to being part of what I loved about music because all I had to do was hear myself playing back at me through the speakers. I feel like the end of that cycle kind of built you up this whole period to get to chaos magic. So you kind of needed to make that run. That's was the point I was going to make. Like you had said it was a long explanation, but it's the most definitive. Had you not had that moment where you spilled out everything, which he took for alpha Omega, and then you built it back up for revenge you never would have got to this point where you could say, you know what? I don't need Harley to do what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm the figure there. So it's, it's a long process for you to get to where you're at with this. I, I really can't tell you how much I appreciate having you on the show. I know um, the hard rules doing these podcasts is that I never wanted to be the stop for a band that had the new record because I always feel like they're disingenuous about what they're doing when they talk. And I found that you to be the complete opposite and you've spilled a lot more than what most do. I also feel that the story that you presented to us in your perspective needed to be heard in this long play format. If we would have cut this up into four, the attention needed for this would have been lost. And I really appreciate you giving us a side, not just, you know, your take on the two sides, but your own, your own experiences. And the writing is actually literally on the wall. Listen, if you listen to the new Harley record, there's not a touch of age of quarrel in it. There's like a half ass Walmart version. That's me saying that's not you, but I, I tried, I really tried. I'm like, I'm this Chrome mag is going to be. And I'm like, no, it just doesn't have that flair, you know, and talking about your picking the way that you do it. They're just missing elements. And yet you hear chaos magic and it really is what would happen if you stored away 20 years to think about the next time you're going to write something for Chromax. So the writings on the wall, the chaos magic is out. I hope you continue to do stuff. Anything you do, you let me know. We'll put it out on our social medias. And I'd love to have another conversation with you in a year or so. And we talk about more positive things and um, just really appreciate your honesty 
and being forthcoming. I think a lot of times people present like the professional affidavit of their, like, you know, their, the, the, the court of public opinion profile and you've given me a stripped down version of who you are and very earnest. And I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I'm very glad gratified to hear that again. Like I never know how people are going to respond you, um, from, from what I gather and have observed, you seem to be, a you know, uh, kind of a, a beacon in the hardcore world and, uh, getting an approval is uh relevant to me so i appreciate it that's it <laughs> this is this has been a good one um i really look forward to what you have going on and i appreciate you understanding that there are so many people that love crow mags and you, and you said it perfectly and the sabbath the sabbath example i uh my mom had ozzy osbourne records on the floor as i was like four or five years old those those images stay with me, but it's actually Black Sabbath of his thing that I find to be the most impactful. And in, and it's true to hardcore. It, it's like the blueprint for so much that we become hardcore punk. And and there are people that don't care about Ozzy. They just love the music. And I feel like Age of Quarrel is one of those records where people just put their fingers in their ears and go, I don't care what they're saying about each other. I just like this record. And I, I wanted to hear your perspective on the record. And you I love the way that we got to keep coming back to it because it's such an important thing for hardcore music and your perspective on life has been that thing that your father said is going to stick me for a while because I feel like every kid in high school or even in seventh and eighth grade should be told it's time to monetize your talents. And that's a fantastic way to look at it. Um, as I say on all these episodes, can't wait to have you back. Um, I'm going to put all your socials in our website page, which people sometimes go to and forget sometimes. So just so people listening, put out your socials and sayonara, I guess. <laughs> um, okay. It's agros, A-G-G-R-O-S dot N-Y-C. That's our website where the store is and you can download the song if, if that's of interest to you. And uh, YouTube dot com slash the agros for the music videos the playthrough and uh i'm going to be doing a web series called guitars are for life um which i initially got the idea because i i'm always asked in interviews about my guitars except for in this one uh, especially my red guitar uh people are always seem to be amazed that i still have it and i you know another lesson that my father taught me is that musical instruments are tools that are made for professional musicians and ordinary people get them too, but they're really tools. They're made to last. And if you have a good one, and when me and my father had that conversation, they were only good guitars. It was before the Guitar Center phenomenon where they made all these consumer guitars. He said, guitars are for life and uh, you should take care of it and it'll last forever. Uh, so I always respond to, do I still have my BC Rich? I said, of course I have it. Guitars are for life. And like I mentioned earlier, when I look at that guitar, I see my life. That guitar was a magic carpet that took me around the world and uh, allowed me to make things that make me proud. Uh, how could I ever part with that guitar? So that'll be the premise of the show where I'll tell the story of uh, my guitars, because uh, oddly enough, all my guitars have great stories. And from talking to people, like uh, I spoke to Kurt Winstein of Down, and he says that he has some good stories. So he's going to be one of my guests. And Sean from the Two Other Boys, I already shot the episode. And uh, it seems that I'm not the only one who has good stories from my guitar. So Guitars for Life will also appear there. And, uh, and then I'm on Instagram and, and, and Facebook uh, as Paris Mayhew, SOC on, uh, on Facebook and uh, just Paris Mayhew on Instagram. Paris, thank you for being on the show. And I look forward to the Guitars for Life stories. And I look forward to more coming out from the agros. We'll link, we'll do the hyperlink so you can go onto the page and see the Chaos Magic video. Just thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for sharing your audience with me and a no. great conversation. No, thank you. That was a pretty awesome podcast interview. That was pretty fucking awesome, I mean, to be honest with you. Uh, Paris is a legend, at least for me, like a, as a videographer, like I, I knew that he was like a Steadicam operator. Like Steadicam is that the giant vest yeah, that you wear that gets you the, the stable shots. They actually use that in Rocky. Like they, yeah. the guy invented that for the, for the Rocky shot where they like running up the stairs. So I always knew there was a steady cam operator. And when I saw that video it blew my mind. Cause like he's in it and there's like layers to it. Cause like he's in 
like different layers of the shot. Yeah. <laughs> and so the fact that he was able to shoot it in like a pretty public space. You know Dude, I mean? the whole story about how he shot it is incredible. And the fact that he took the time to tell us about how he did it is fantastic. Also, when people are like, oh, where's he been? He's a very successful, uh, when you hear his story about college and like what he did to get his degree. And then he shot so many uh, different music videos and then he pivoted from music videos to be a camera operator. He has had a successful career, as he said, for so long. The, uh, the opportunity to write music and the time, like my man right now is uh, away for three months in a, a location out of, outside the country, but still in the United States for that three months shooting. Like this is his career. He just has the opportunity now with the COVID, he had months and months off to write these the the, the chaos magic and the aggro stuff. So we got we got him at a low period. He's right back to work so hard, mm. you know. And thankfully, because of COVID, in some regard, the aggros who want to go out and play, they're not going to be able to yet. But it gives him the time, and that's the reason why you haven't seen him in some musical fashion. But I mean, for me, you have the history, the beginnings. You, if anybody ever was like, you know, I don't even know how much Paris really did in the Chromags, that settled the dispute. Yeah, because for me, like I. I know about everyone else in Chrome Mags, and Paris is always like the other person I never knew much about. So to finally hear this and watch it is like amazing to hear that perspective, that story, because like his involvement is critical in the band. Boy, it's especially there's a part where we talked about the strumming, and I said, you know, so many people were talking about his style out of attack, and he immediately said, like, oh yeah, well I had to show Harley how to play the bass, and then you think about it, Harley was 15 years old playing the drums. Paris is the one who wrote the riffs. Paris would have showed Harley on the bass what to play. And there's this weird sentimental moment where he was talking about like why he stayed with Harley. He's like, I had someone play back to me the music that I wrote and that was their symbiotic relationship, but it was so toxic they had to break apart. But Paris is the reason why the Chromax sounds the way the Chromax. So this video conversation to me definitively puts his footprint in there. It's not Harley, John, and Paris back here. It's like Harley, um, Paris and then John and then everything comes and explodes outward and that's why it's been fragmented that's why the history post Asia Quarrel has so many different members because it was that that chaos of all of them and then so when he's talking about that it just blew my mind but just from a very personal level I grew up with that pop um, hearing his father and what he said and then like the, that that is inspiring and he actually kind of like fuck I didn't I say like man I didn't have a dad like that he didn't tell me that like such valuable words at such a young age and that to have a, someone in your corner to put you on, to get your head like, I gotta do this. Uh, that that shows you right now why he's a steady, a steady cam guy and didn't try to do seven versions of the Chrome Mags with Harley from the time they linked back at Revenge until now. And it's a he was a stand up dude. It was a great interview and um, I'm happy we got to do it. And I really appreciate you sincerely for coming in because I do these things sometimes. I say, hey, Sonny, I got this idea. And when I mean the idea, it's done and I need you to help me. And you're Heaven's always a like- Heaven's a lot, heaven's a lot. I think, I mean, I've been doing yeah, it. Like, hey, I got this thing, but it, it's actually happening and we need to do it. Not, yeah, yeah. hey, would you want to do it? And that's my bad. And just thank you for doing that's this one. Good. Especially on episode three, zero, and you were number two. Shout out to Chris Bridge Nine, the shirt I was talking about in the episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. Boom. This is it. He put it back out for the 25th anniversary. Okay. I was so psyched. Hell yeah. Like, legit. So fucking happy. Yeah. So, yeah. If you guys liked it, maybe we'll do more in time when the technology that I have catches up with me. And I don't, <laughs> I don't just come into your living room and say, hey, can you help me? Yeah. So, we'll see it. Is there anything else you want to mention to people about upcoming episodes or what you got in, in store? Well, like I said, this is the beginning of, we're going to delve into the innovation and the people in the innovation of hardcore. So Paris, if you listen to this, you got to hear at the very outset of hardcore, like this is when it's first form, forming what it's gonna be. When it goes from being staggered bands, a dozen bands with their own sound, to be, be a formulaic process, and he's right in there in a the mix, and he puts metal, he puts motorhead, and that's a driving force in the first half of the 80s. And then the guys we're talking about, uh, next week is Richie Birkenhead, He's gonna tell you how he did Underdog in 1985 and how he took hardcore. And then later after the breakdown, the wall store said, I'm done with being a carbon copy of every straight edge dude. I wanna go into, into another. Okay. And then Wally is the episode after and Wally echoes that and says like, you know, Gorilla Biscuits was great. Doing Warzone was great. Doing the tour of you today was great. But I wanna try doing Quicksand. And we only do two hours with him, so. Yeah. But uh, this is about learning 
not only who did what, but why these things happened so we can all learn. And, and every one of these stories, like I said, from episode one to 30, you can do what these guys have done. And there's a blueprint to do it if you want to do it. Well, that's the thing. Like when you first hear about these bands and you're coming into this, you're like, how do they, like, where do they come from? How do they do it? How do they begin? So to hear these podcasts and that story breaks it down and makes it accessible. So someone listening to it for the first time and hearing their story, it makes it feel like, makes them feel like, oh, I can go out and do what they did. How, you know old, I mean? how old were you when you shot the first This Is Hard Work? It was 2009. Yeah, so how old were you? Uh, 23. Yeah, Walter quit doing Gorilla Biscuits at 19. <laughs> 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 and like Paris and Harley played the first cro show before they were 18 years old. And as he says in the podcast, I just went to the Lower East Side because we lived near there and there was bars that let us drink at 15. And it's like so much of hardcore starts at this early, early, early stage. So a lot of our listeners are not 15, they're 30, they're yeah. 40, or even in the 20s, but you could do everything yes. because a lot of what's done in hardcore is done in that magic window of, I don't have a career, I don't have kids, I don't have bills, I can just do what I need to do with the world. And like you yourself, Maddie Watkins or uh, Ernie Talbert, so many people that came into, I need to focus on what I'm gonna do to make myself happy and to create they hit it in their late 20s, but they hear these stories at such an early age with these innovators and the music end, this, which actually drove the entire culture at, in their teens and early 20s is fantastic. And that's what I wanted to have in the next couple episodes. And that's what we're going towards. Yeah, I mean, it gets harder the older you get, but it's never, I don't think it's ever too late. It's never too late to like. Well, you keep it. learning new shit. You have a 3D printer. You built, you're about to patent a digital claw or a claw to make moving cameras. I'm around. not going to patent it because it's he very expensive patent. to patent it. He's going to patent it. But you're doing the podcast at how old are you now? 40. You hit 40. Yeah, hit and you're 40. doing a podcast. I so hit 40 like, and, a, and two months later, a podcast. So the, the moral of the story is if you're inspired by someone or something, just go fucking do it. That's exactly what this is. That's what, the, the hardcore inspired me to do so much. And then without having our shows and our daily Twitter arguments and just focusing on podcasts, I was able to reconnect and like get so driven. I'm so excited for everything all over again from the 1977 era of punk rock that would lead into hardcore to the bands that are coming out now that we put, uh, put out on every episode in the intro. So thank you guys once again. Hate56.com. Follow him on everything. And if you want to check out the podcast and you never look at our episode pages, I do it. It's tiacpodcast.com. You can find us everywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paris. And next video, I don't know when it's going to be. So peace.